الله أكبر الله أكبر My name is Ahmed Naim and I'll be your chairman for the evening. What we are, what we've come to listen to tonight is Mr. Ahmed Didat. What he'll be speaking upon is a book written by the Pope. Now in this book, he deals with various religions and amongst one of the religions he deals with is Islam. Now in the book, he, deal, he devotes approximately four pages to Islam. And it is those four pages that Mr. Didat would reply to tonight. So without keeping you further, I would call Mr. Didat to speak to you tonight. Thank you. Alhamdulillahi wahda. Wa salatu wa salamu ala amal la nabi ba'da. Allahumma ya mufattihu al-abwaab, wa ya musabibu al-asbaab, wa ya dalil al-ha'irin. توكلت عليك يا رب العالمين وأفوض أمري لله إن الله بصير بالعباد. Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters, the topic has been well advertised. The topic is Islam's answer to the Pope's pious pronouncements. I'm sure all of you must have seen this by now. Islam's answer to the Pope's pious pronouncements. An amazing thing this morning, I went to Maritzburg and got the Maritzburg newspaper called the Natal Witness. We had also supplied them with the advert. This advert appeared in the Sunday Tribune, in the Daily News, in the Tal Mercury, in the Leader, in the Post, as is. But the witness, the Natal witness in Maritzburg, they have changed the title. The advert appeared, the advert appears, but they put it, Islam's answer to the Pope's pronouncements. The word pious is taken out. Pious is eliminated. And they give us a reason that the ASA, there is a body called the Advertising Standards Authority, ASA. They send us a fax telling us, in reference to this advert, it says here, the word of the use, pious, in this particular context, may be, may be seen to be disparaging. This word, pious, may be seen to be disparaging in terms of Clause 6, Section 2 of the Code of Advertising Practice. So if you take the word pious out, then they will allow the advert. Otherwise, the advert is rejected. What makes me to consider him pious? You see, in the Holy Quran, in Surah Maryam, Surah Maryam, Chapter 19 of the Holy Quran, Allah says, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَنُ وَلَدًا And they say that Ar-Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. They say, who say? The Christians. They say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has begotten a son. In answer to that, Allah says, لَقَدَ جِئْتُمْ شَيْءٍ إِدَّا is one of the most abominable assertions, the worst Swearing that you can give Allah is this. Takadu samawatu yatafattarna minhu. Eti the skies are ready to burst. Watan shakkal ardu. And the earth to split asanda. Wata khirul jibal hadda. And the mountains to fall down in utter ruin. Anda awlir rahmani walada. That they should say that Ar Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten his son. Allah reacts very strongly. The worst swearing I can give any of you. is to call you a bastard. This word bastard, people get shocked. It is from the Holy Bible. The King James Version has this word bastard three times in this Bible. Three times the word bastard. So look, this is biblical. This is not an offensive word anymore. It's in the Holy Bible. 
the worst swing I can give anybody is to call you a bastard, insinuating that your mother had committed zina, adultery. That's the strongest. Worst swing I can give anybody is to call him that. Allah says the worst swing you can give me, him, is to say that he has begotten a son. Because begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. How can you attribute such a quality to God? That God begot a son. Somebody else's wife. Joseph the carpenter's wife. He goes and have sex with her. And beget a bastard child. Mashallah. May Allah forgive. So he reacts very strongly. Now his holiness the Pope. You see in this book of his. Crossing the threshold of hope. He is giving biblical quotation in this 200 and some 20 pages. He has quoted the Bible 209 times. In this book, little book, 209 times he's quoted the Holy Bible. Verses, 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 verses. And one verse, he quotes it eight times. Eight times the same verse. Amazing. No other verse. That one verse he quoted eight times. And that is the Gospel of St. John, chapter 3, verse 16. John 3, 16 is a famous verse among the Christians. No Christian can do missionary work without memorizing this. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him might have eternal life and shall not perish. The only begotten son God has got, according to the Bible, many sons. He's got sons by the tons in the Bible. But he said, no, Jesus is not like that. Jesus is the only begotten son. Begotten, not made. Not like Adam. Adam was made by God. Every dog, pig and donkey was made by God. Not like that. This is begotten, not made. Means he had sexed and produced. Begetting means sexed and produced. So Allah reacts. And His Holiness the Pope, eight times in his book, the same chapter, John 3, 16, he quotes. And every time he quotes, he takes the word begotten out. Shouldn't we applaud him? Please, give it a, give it a clap. <laughs> so if I call him this a pious thing, he's heeding the warning of the Quran. He has heeded. So in my Quran speaks in the Sunday Tribune, I quote this Quranic ayah. Every week, if you people are reading it, I don't know whether I'm just throwing it away. You people, I don't know whether you benefit from it. The Quran speaks. Every Sunday, there's a quotation from the Holy Quran with commentary. So I quoted this ayah a couple of months ago. So, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَنُ وَلَدَا لَكَدْ جِئْتُمْ شَيْئًا إِدَّا That's all. So those who say that Allah has begotten a son, this is one of the most monstrous things for anybody to do. Most abominable thing for anybody to do. To say that Allah begot a son. And in my notes, I said, you see, His Holiness the Pope, he has heeded the warning of the Quran. Don't talk like that. Allah says, don't talk like that. You're swearing me. You see, you young people, you come along, you want to argue and debate with me. Now people, young people, they want to have a little brushing. I don't mind, I don't mind, I enjoy it. And you irritate me. I'm an old man, 77. Maybe I didn't have a good night's sleep. Maybe I had taken some medicine, some pills, and you irritate me. So what I say, I say, go, go, man, you're a bloody fool. You're a fool. What do you do? You laugh. No, no, I'm sure you laugh. You won't punch me on the jaw. Eh, for calling you a fool. And you irritate me further. I said, go, go, man. You are a bloody ox. You know ox? You know ox? Eh? I said, go, go, man. You are a bloody monkey. I said, you are a bloody donkey. What you do? You laugh. You laugh. No, I said, the old man is tired now, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm rubbing him the wrong way around. But if I take your mother's name, no laughter. I said, uncle, not one more word. I'm going to lose all the respect I have for you. Already it's gone. If once I touch your mother's name, you, there's no more respect. But you say, the shot of punching me on the jaw, you say, look, I'm going to lose all the respect I have for you. Don't take my mother's name. Don't take my wife's name. Don't take my daughter's name. Call me what you like. Call me monkey. Call me donkey. 
Call me a fool, call me what you like, but don't take my mother's name. Am I right? This is how Allah reacts. That's the worst swearing they can give me is this. And His Holiness, the Pope, has heeded the warning and He has expunged it eight times out of eight. Eight out of eight times. Not even by mistake the word begotten got in. Inadvertently, it didn't get in. So I take off my hat to the Pope and if he was here, I'd kiss his hand. And I'll encourage everybody when he comes in September, kiss his hand. That guy deserves that you kiss his hands. But if you want to go and kiss his hand, he'll kick you in the face. I mean, this man is a master psychologist. Look, he's using psychology. He's catching fish. He'll kick you in the face. This is how he puts it. For example, I'll show you. Were you all given this pamphlet? You are supposed to be given tonight. Everybody was supposed to have this pamphlet. What happened? The Pope says, this pamphlet, the whole chapter from this book is reproduced. And this was supposed to be given out to each and everyone here tonight. Nobody has received it. Stop. I think we were very busy. My brother Kasim, who has been in charge of this, we were whole day in Marisburg in the Supreme Court, waiting for the master of the Supreme Court to behead us all. I left at 4 o'clock to go home and charge my batteries for this. And they just finished 6 o'clock and they came now. So please forgive them. If you have the time, pick it up from the IPC. The whole chapter on Islam, on the life of Muhammad, is in this book. We reproduced it here. And this was, I was supposed to give it to you more like a text to say, now, let's see on the front page, what does it say? It says, he says, I'm quoting the Pope again. Some of the most beautiful names in the human language are given to the God of the Quran. Some of the most beautiful names in the human language are given to the God of the Quran. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I had touched this on the 26th of July here in this hall. How many of you were present? Please put up your hand, those of you who were present. Just put up high that I can see. No, it bears repeating. It bears repeating. See, if all of you were here, then I says, no, let's carry on from there. But the bulk of you, I can see you were not here. So here are some of the most beautiful names in the human language are given to the God of the Quran. Most probably somebody told him. Or probably he read the Quran. Because in the Holy Quran, Allah says, Allah says, Hu Allahu Lazi la ilaha illahu. He is Allah besides whom there is no other God. Al Malik, the King. Al Quddus, the Holy One. As Salam, the source of peace and perfection. Al Mu'min, the guardian of faith. Al Muhaymin, the preserver of safety. Al Aziz, the exalted in might. Al Jabbar, the irresistible. Al Mutakabir, the Supreme. Subhanallah, Amma Yushrikun. Glory to Allah. He is free from the things that they attribute to Him. Who Allah? He is Allah. Al Khalik, the Creator. Al Bari, the Evolver. Al Muthawir, the Bestower of Forms and Colors. Who Al As Lahul Asmaul Husna. These are the most beautiful names. Allah says that. And the Pope reproduces that. Some of the most beautiful names in the human language are given to the God of the Quran. There's nothing like that in his Bible. There's nothing like that in the Bhagavad Gita or the Ramayana. There's no other religious scripture on earth which has this type of attributes given to God Almighty. And the Pope says that. Coming from the mouth of the enemy, he says that these are the most beautiful names in the human language are given to the God of the Quran, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 99 attributes. Then he uses one word and he discounts it all. He's a master psychologist. Look, he's caught us. 
When he says these beautiful words, confirming the Quranic statement, Lahul Asma'ul Husna, these are the most beautiful names Allah says, and he says some of the most beautiful names in the human language are given to the God of the Quran. Could we have said better than that? No. Then he uses one word, and that one word, he discounts it all. And last time I was offering my daughter's first, you know, a hundred run for giving me two reasons why the Muslim was not likely to have this book. You remember? I said, the Muslim is not likely to have this book. And in the audience, I asked, is there anybody who has seen this book or read it? I own it. Please put up your hand. And there was only one lady. She put up her hand. So I asked her, are you a Roman Catholic? She says, no. She has something else. I said, oh. So only one lady had this book. In the whole audience, it was a packed house that night on the 26th. Packed. But only one person had the book. So I said, there are two reasons why a Muslim was not likely to have this book. And anybody, starting with my sisters, my daughters, say, anybody gives me the two reasons, this 100 rand is for you. So I bring another 100 rand for you. That night, nobody had it. I took it back. I took it back because nobody had the right answer. Nobody, not even the men. But first chance I'm giving to my daughters. One word, very simple word. He uses one word to destroy it all, to undo what he has said. Yes, my sister. Father. Mm -hmm. Come, don't be afraid. There's nothing to lose. There's 100 rands to gain. If you don't need it, give it to charity. Come, 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 my sisters, my daughters. <laughs> that sounds nice. Yes, Ben. Huh? Begotten now. All right, I leave it open to the men now. Yes. Ah, look, one second, one second, one second. If you have heard me before, you are disqualified. <laughs> you know, suppose you were sitting with me and I was chatting with you and I shared it with you and I offered you 100 rand then. I did. I did offer to a number of people 100 rands. This journalist from the Natal Daily News, they came along and I said, right, this is what the Pope says. Right, Maui, beautiful. Then I said, look, I give you 100 rands. I take it out from my pocket. One word this guy used and he discounts it all. Come on, one, 100 rands. Huh? No, no, I don't want to know that. I want to know what word, that one word. Huh? No. Oh. Did you hear from me? Yes, His Holiness. He uses one word. I said, that one word is, but. But. That's all. The word is, but. The next word after, in the human language, comma, and the next word is, but. Now, that word, but. This has been butting it. He butted it. This comes. That means mm, all this what I say is true, but it's nothing. It's all whitewash. But he is ultimately a god outside of the world. A god who is only majesty. But he is a god. Is this a lie of yours? He is outside of the world. He is there, sitting in his heavens, in outer space. His majesty, Al-Aziz, the exalted might, Al-Jabbar, the irresistible, Al-Mutakabbir, the supreme, he's there, far, far away. His only majesty. So we respond, he says, sir, you see, besides what you are saying, the Quran also speaks about Allah, besides the qualities I gave you just now. He speaks about it, As-Sami basir he is the all-hearing, the all-seeing. Allah. These are his qualities. He is al-latiful khabir. He is the subtle, knowing the finest mysteries. Al-khabir, the aware of everything. He is al hayyul qayyum He is self-subsisting. He is eternal. He is al-ghafur al-wadud. He is of forgiving. He is loving. And 80 more attributes. Besides the ones I have given you already. 
But says, yes, you see, but his only majesty, he is never Emmanuel. He is never Emmanuel. You know what Emmanuel means? God with us. Emmanuel means God with us. You see, we have God with us. Jesus Christ is God Almighty who came down to earth. Your Allah is there in the heavens. We say, look, the Quran says, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِكُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ To Allah belongs the east and the west. فَأَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا فَسَمَا وَجْهُ اللَّهِ And whichever way you turn is the presence of Allah. Allah says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ He is indeed closer to you than your jugular veins, your very life, your very existence. We say, yes, but not like Jesus. He is with us. He is there, but you can't see him. You can't see him. Here, this God, we can lean on his breast. John, John, Gospel of St. John, chapter 13, verse 23. One of the disciples at the Last Supper, he was, the Bible says, verse 23, that is sleeping on his bosom. Can you do that to Allah? Can you do that to Allah? You sleep on Allah's bosom? Hmm? Verse 25, says, and resting on his breast, is asking, who is it that's going to betray you? Just, you that do that to Allah? Look, this is Jesus. You can say, this is God, Jesus. He's there. You can sleep on his breast, on his bosom. He's eating broiled fish and honeycomb with you. He's going to the toilet. Does it befit Allah? No. He says, you see, he is Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. He is God with us. I am asking His Holiness, if He was here, if we were having a dialogue, say, Your Holiness, where did you get this? It's no, it is in the Gospel of St. Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, chapter 1, verse 23. So what does it say? It, says, it says that a virgin shall bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Where did you get this, sir? Where did Matthew get this? Is he got it from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. This guy has picked it up from there and put it into the New Testament. Matthew, chapter 1, verse 23. He shall be called Emmanuel. Now, if you have a concordance, and it's not likely, a concordance means every word of the Bible is there. This one occurs so many times, this one occurs so many times, this one occurs a hundred times, if you have a concordance, I have. I need it, you see, I need it to make things easy for me. In the concordance, the word Emmanuel occurs only once in the New Testament. Only once. Matthew chapter 1 verse 23. Only once. So if he was supposed to be called Emmanuel, somebody must have called him Emmanuel. In the 27 books of the New Testament, the word Emmanuel does not recur, does not occur again. Once only. That means nobody called him Emmanuel. So if a prophecy is made that this thing is going to happen, people will call him Emmanuel, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. Then we'll know, says he was called by people Emmanuel. If there was a prophecy about John Washtela, I'm, I'm sorry, Caron, Caron, Caron Washtela, that he will become the Pope in 1981 of the Roman Catholic Church. There's a prophecy. There was a prophecy. I'm asking the Pope. His name is Caron Wojtela. That's his native name. When he was born, he was baptized Caron. And Wojtela is his surname. It's when he becomes a Pope, then the name changes. He takes on a title. Pope John Paul II. The one who died before him in one month and three days. The previous Pope. One month and the people poisoned him. He took his place. That was Pope John Paul I. So he took the same title as Pope John Paul II. That's his choice. I said, if you were never, if you had never become a Pope, and there was a prophecy about Coran Washtela becoming a Pope, and you didn't become a Pope, what does it mean? It's worthless, rubbish. Even if there are a thousand prophecies about Karen Washtela, he'll become a Pope. And if you didn't become a Pope, nobody called you a Pope in your life, then you're not the Pope. Somebody must call you Pope. Pope John Paul II. Pope John Paul II. We call him so. So now I said, if there was a prophecy, the prophecy is fulfilled. 
in you. This was supposed to be fulfilled in Jesus. Did his mother call him Emmanuel? The schools, the children with whom he was schooling, did any one of those children call him Emmanuel? Did any of his disciples call him Emmanuel? In his life, while he walked this earth, is there a single person called him Emmanuel? He says, no. Then say, what kind of prophecy is this? Huh? You're just thumb-sucking something, like a little baby, spoiled child. It's your toy. You say, this is it. But nobody called him Emmanuel. Emmanuel. I don't know whether you had the chance of <laughs> reading Edwards. Emmanuel. There was a film here, man, pornographic film. It was banned in this country under the old government, under the new government, Emmanuel, pornography. This woman is a, is a, is a harlot, a whore, a prostitute, Emmanuel. This was a film going on here for quite some time in Durban. Do you know that? And I, thank God you don't read all that. <laughs> Emmanuel means God with us. But the name of the prostitute, would you call her? Miss God with us, Miss God with us, that's what it means. Huh? That prostitute, if you met her in the flesh, will you call her, what's your name? See, my father gave me the name Emmanuel. No, possible. Would you call her, says, God with us? Miss, this prostitute, you're going to bargain. Hmm? You say, God with us, God with us, what's the price? Huh? Is that how you talk? Is that what? Emmanuel means God with us. No, that's what it means. <laughs> I said, there are so many names, there are so many names. You see, the Jews gave their children names. We give our children names. Beautiful names. Our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His father had died before he was born. His grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. He takes him to the Kaaba as an infant in his arms. And he's introducing this little child, his grandson, to the chiefs of the Quraysh. They're asking, what's his name? He says, Muhammad. He says, Muhammad? It's a very strange name. First time we hear that word. He said, you see, I want my grandchild to be praised throughout the world. That's his ambition. He's a mushrik. The grandfather is a mushrik. But this is his desire that my grandchild, the remnant of my son, Abdullah, I want his name to be broadcast throughout the world and praised throughout the world. It happens. His wish is fulfilled. Five times a day, every day of the year, the Muazzin goes on top of the minaret and he shouts, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Every name has some kind of a sentimental connection, some prophetic <coughs> quality. So, he, grandfather of the Prophet, gave this name to our Nabi, Muhammad. The praised one. May Allah have him praised. Then we find in the Bible names like Eli. Eli. In the book of Samuel, first book of Samuel, in the Bible. 32 times there is a priest, his name is Eli. You know what Eli means in Hebrew? My God. Eli means my God. My God. That's his name. His name is my God. Mr. My God, how are you, Mr. My God? Hey, my, his, his father is calling him My God. His mother is calling him My God. Everybody is calling him My God. Eli means My God. So, we, and Jesus on the cross, according to the Bible, is supposed to have shout, cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Which means, My God, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Was he shouting for the priest? My God, My God, who? That priest? My God. No, 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 this is the name. People give name to your children that maybe they imbibe that quality of ever thinking that God is with you. A lie. My God. Everything. My God. My God. We have a family here called Bismillah family. Yeah? You know, the wives of Dr. Mayat and Dr. Mal. Dr. Mal's wife passed away, I think, in an accident. In an accident, yes. Uh, Zohra Mayat, Zohra Mayat of the Cultural Center? Yes. You know what's her surname? Anybody know? No hundred round. No hundred round for you. Anybody know? Bismillah. No, her surname is Bismillah. See? 
Bismillah means in the name of Allah. That's a surname. This is his brother, her brother, Bismillah. Mr. Ahmad, Bismillah. Our brother Muhammad, Bismillah. Our sister Fatima, Bismillah. No, means that is a surname. In the name of Allah. In the name of Allah. In the name. That's a name. She is not Allah. The father is not Allah. No, no, this is a name, a quality that you are giving. You want the person to be ever remembering Bismillah in the name of Allah. Everything you do, Bismillah. In the Bible, you have a prophet by the name of Joel. Joel. Jo, Jo means Jah. They say it means Yehovah. Jehovah. El means God. He's God. Yehovah God. That's his name. Joel. And General Dayan. You know, General Dayan of Israel, the one eyed man. His daughter came here to South Africa. She was a journalist. And you know what's her name? Yael Dayan. Yael Dayan. That's her name. You know what Yael means? Oh God. Oh God. Yael means oh God. This is the name people give their children with the idea that they have this godly quality. Ever thinking, oh, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Wallah, Wallah, Wallah. But Yael is not oh God. She is not God. Her father didn't think when he gave the name, he says, this is my God. Or the mother says, this is my God. No, no. These are the names that you give to people that may they imbibe those qualities. Emmanuel. You must have that quality to be called Emmanuel. And you know what? This word, Emmanuel, is in the Quran. If I were to offer you a hundred rounds, you can't get it. Yaqari, you know, Emmanuel in Arabic form is in the Quran. Anybody know? You know? Emmanuel is in the Quran. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. I'm glad I didn't offer the hundred runs. <laughs> <laughs> it says in Surah Tawbah, Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, ayah number 40. This word Emmanuel, how it comes. Allah says, Is Huma fil ghari? When they two were in the cave. The story is, Allah doesn't go into details. He doesn't go into stories. The Quran is not a once upon a time book telling you fairy tales. It's a concentrated book. It goes straight to the point, one verse, and it see how much it tells you. Is Huma fil ghari? When they were both in the cave, is the hijra. Allah tells him, now it's time that you move from Makkah, go to Medina. So as soon as they leave Makkah, they say, look, if they keep on running, the people with faster horses or camels, they'll catch up and they'll kill them. So just outside Makkah, there is a cave, Khare Thawr. So they went and spent three days there, three days and three nights in the cave, waiting for the, the, the chase to be over, to cool down before moving further. And in the cave while they're there, the mushriks came to the mouth of the cave. They reached it, smelling it out, thinking, looking for footprints. And they came to the mouth of the cave. And if they only bent down, they could have seen them. So Hazrat Abba Bakr Siddiq, he says, Ya Rasulullah, they are on us. We are alone. Is Huma fil ghari? When they too were in the cave. Is yaqulu li sahibihi. He said to his companion, La tahzan, don't fear, fear not. Inna Allah ma'ana, Allah is with us. Inna, most certainly, most assuredly, verily, Allah is with us. Inna Allah ma'ana, Allah ma'ana, Allah ma'ana, Al ma'ana, Emmanuel, God with us. This is the quality of the Prophet. He didn't know that he was fulfilling prophecies of the book of Isaiah from the Old Testament. He doesn't know all that. That there's something written in the Bible. That is in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He knows nothing about it. Wallah, he knew nothing about it. This is what Allah makes him to say. Is huma fil ghari, is yaqulu li sahibihi, la tahzan, inna Allah ma'ana, Allah is with us. This is the quality of the man. 
In contrast, according to your book, according to your record, we're telling the Christian. Jesus Christ says, God has deserted him. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Say, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? You let me down. Muhammad says, no, Allah is with us. To whom does this quality fit? To your Jesus, you are only claiming, you are thumb sucking. Here is an actual life experience and this is not done you know, and afterwards, 1400 years ago, this is in the Quran, and the Prophet ﷺ, he knew nothing about the Bible. There was no Christian Bible in the 6th century, in, in Arabic. There was no Bible in the Arabic language in the 6th century. That when Abu could have seen, and he could, can you imagine an Ummi going through the Bible and encyclopedia, and you know, finding that word Emmanuel in the book of Isaiah, and finding that word again uh, in the book of Matthew, and then he says, now look, let me also... I'm going to use that word, and he's waiting for the opportunity, and he got the opportunity in the cave, and he used it. Can you imagine? Inna Allah ma'ana. Ah, I have a friend in, in Abu Dhabi. He's a doctor, urologist. His name is Abdul Munim Billah. Abdul Munim Billah. Billah is his surname. Abdul Munim Billah. Billah means with Allah. That's his father's name, Billah. Our friend in, in Algeria, the first person to become the president after the fight with the, with the French. Ahmad bin, Ahmad bin Billah, first president or prime minister of Algeria, freeing themselves from the French. His name was Ahmad bin Billah. Ahmad, sir, with Allah. Now, what do you say? His father's name was Billah. With Allah. Was he Allah? Wherever he went around. No, no. This is the quality. We want the person to imbibe that quality that he's thinking that Allah is ever with us. Allah is ever with us. Ever conscious of his presence. Then, His Holiness the Pope, he says here, he said, the council, the Roman Catholic Church, the council, has also called for the church to have a pro dialogue with the followers of the prophet. To have a dialogue with the followers of the Prophet. We're going to have a dialogue with the Muslims. The word Prophet, here in his book, he writes in inverted commas. You know, there's two commas, like two wings. The word Prophet in inverted commas. Then on page 43, again, he uses that word prophet for our Nabi Akarim Sallallahu in inverted commas. So if we were having a dialogue, he says, Your Holiness, look, let us come to terms. Let us understand the terminology that we are using. When you use words, we want to know what you mean. Do we mean the same thing? When we talk about the prophet, the prophet, the holy prophet, you know we're talking about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But we write the word prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, prophet. But you don't put inverted commas. So, Your Holiness, will you please explain why those inverted commas? You know what it means? You know what it means? Inverted commas, what do they mean? They mean that I don't say that. It's what people say. I'm only quoting, people say, prophet, prophet, prophet. I use the word prophet. I don't believe that he's a prophet. Therefore, you put inverted commas. I say, his holiness, if I put that in inverted commas, it means, I don't say that. That's what people say. Inverted commas. That's what it means in English. Inverted commas. So I want to know, your holiness, you have used this word prophet twice in your book about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and both times you put the word in inverted commas. Will you please explain? Why did you put the word in inverted commas? In his language, in the Western languages, it means I'm quoting. That's what people say. I don't say that. So you do not accept him as a prophet. We accept your Jesus as one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe in his miraculous birth. We believe in his many miracles including those of giving life back to the dead by Allah's permission, and of healing those born blind and the lepers by Allah's permission. We believe in all that. As a prophet, a mighty messenger of God. And my Rasul, Karim, my prophet, you put him in inverted commas. Why? The meaning is you don't accept it. 
I want to know why. Oh, he said, you see, he has so many wives. He has so many wives. My Jesus had no wives. So I said, the number of wives disqualifies a person. In your sight, the number of wives, how many had? Nine or 11? Okay. Disqualifies the man. I said, yes. But I said, you see, in your holy Bible, Solomon, the wise, he's got 700 wives and 300 concubines, 1,000 women at his disposal. 1,000, 700 wives and 300 concubines. And he is called the son of God in the Bible. He's the son of God, Suleiman al -Islam. Solomon. That doesn't disqualify him. If a thousand wives, the man gets, doesn't get disqualified. Why should a man with nine wives get disqualified? Huh? huh? I mean, what kind of double standard is this? Oh, he performed no miracles. I said, look, the greatest miracle that he performed is the Quran. I said, no, no, no. I want something that man walks on the water, flying in the air like a bird, giving life back to the dead, making water into wine. Muhammad didn't do anything like that. Ah, there are some 300 miracles recorded about our Nabi. The Muslims don't go into that. We say, this is basically, come down to earth. Here, let's talk, man. Sense, reason, let's logic. Because I can't reproduce the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine and say, now believe. I turn this water into wine, drink it, and you taste it. Yeah, it tastes like wine. So now I tell you, one plus one plus one is one. Believe with that. I said, no, man, Mr. D, that has got no connection. No connection between turning water into wine and one plus one plus one. It's three. It can never be one. I said, no. Can't you see what I can do? I said, nonsense. He didn't perform any miracles. But I said, you see, sir, in your book, in your Bible, Jesus Christ, he testifies about Yahya alayhi salam. They call him John the Baptist. Yahya alayhi salam. He says, Jesus says, among those born of women, everybody is born of woman. He's a human being. Among those born of women, there has not risen another greater than John the Baptist. The greatest of the Jewish prophets is John the Baptist, Yahya alayhi salam. And he performed no miracles, according to your book. Not one. So how can you disqualify Muhammad? See, but now this is the style. This is the style that they go to. They want to have a dialogue. They want to have a dialogue with the followers of the prophet. He says, come, let us talk. We want to have a dialogue. We have been advertising in the papers. That guy, when he responded to that advert of ours, that His Holiness the Pope has heeded the warning of the Quran. He has explained the word. I said then seven times because that's the, I, I counted seven times, but now I found one more. Eight times. In the letter I wrote to the press, I said seven times. Actually now eight times in that book. He, used, he expunges the word. Be God. So I said, now, let us talk. Let us talk. So he wrote back. He said, you see, he didn't heed the warning of the Quran. Not because the Quran says, don't talk like that. Stop it. That he stopped it. He has been using the new American standard version of the Bible. That's what he said. The Pope has been using the new American standard version of the Bible. And that was new to me. I have dozens of different Bibles, but I didn't have that. So I sent my man to the Bible house in Smith Street and purchased one, the new American Standard Version of the Bible. It cost me 13 rands. Cheap, cheap. 13 rands. I tell you, cheap. For an encyclopedia of a thousand pages. Cheap. Compared to this 200 page book, 60 rands. Less one cent change. 59.99. 59.99. Compared to this, 2,000, 1,000 pages at least, for 13 rands is cheap, good value. So, first thing I do, I look for John 3.16. And I find the word begotten there, still there. So I read back to the press. I said, you see, this guy is talking, what is truth? He's telling me that we are not speaking the truth, that the Pope has heeded the warning of the Quran. What is truth? Now I'm asking the question, who is speaking the truth? You tell me, it's in all, all in, in the newspapers. He said, this is what he got from the, the New American Standard Version. I said, now I find that the word is there. That means you lied. I don't say you lied. But I said, it's there. Now, who is speaking the truth, you or me? That means it still stands. That he has heeded the Quranic warning. And I said, look, the Pope is talking about having dialogue. Talk, talk, man, talk. 
So I said, look, I am prepared to arrange a meeting for Archbishop Napier in Durban. I said, in the King's Park, I'll get 40,000 people, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, and Jews to come and listen to you. 40,000 at my expense. And we can discuss subjects like, is the Bible God's word? Is Jesus God? Was Christ crucified? And so on. I gave the number of titles. Come, let us talk. They are silent like church mice. This is church mice. Finish. Finish. Silence. No, no. You see, when His Holiness the Pope, when he talks about dialogue, he doesn't mean dialogue. Dialogue Allah wants us to have with him, with the Jews and the Christians. One third of the Quran speaks about the Jews and the Christians. One third is devoted to Jews and Christians. That one third we seem to know nothing about. Allah says in the Holy Quran, Qul, say, Ya Ahl al-Kitab ta'al. O people of the book, Ahl al-Kitab, who's people of the book? Jews and Christians, ta'ala, come. Ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. What the legal people say, common terms. Let's establish common terms on which we are agreed so we don't have a debate. No arguments. Common terms. Let us come to, onto a common platform. And that getting together, Allah says, number one, Allah na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah, wala nushirika bihi shay'an, and that we associate no partners with him, wala yattakhiza ba'dun abadun arbaban min dunillah, and that we do not take from among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fa'in tawallaw, but if they turn back, fa'kulu shahadu bianna muslimun, tell them that we are Muslims, we have submitted our wills to the will of Allah. Come, come, call them. Are we calling them? Are we calling them? Amazing, amazing. The whole Muslim world, nobody's doing it. Nobody's really doing it, I'm telling you. I can go on telling you about the Arabs, you know, how they prod me and how I, uh, how I handle them, Alhamdulillah. That's another story, that's another story. But dialogue, let's have a dialogue. We are saying, come, let us talk. No, when he says dialogue, actually he's telling his people, go and convert these people. These people are already prepared to receive Jesus. Look, they accept him as one of the mightiest messengers of God. They believe in his miraculous birth, which many modern day Christians, including the bishops of the Anglican church, they don't believe. But we Muslims, we believe that Hazrat Isa a.s. was born without a father. Miracle of Allah's creation. He believes that Jesus is the Messiah, the Messiah. They believe, the Muslims, they believe that he gave life back to the dead by Allah's permission and he healed those born blind and the lepers by Allah's permission. Look, they're going to, together with us, man. What he needs is a gentle push. That's all. Make him to accept that this Jesus, he died for your sins. That's all. And you ungrateful people, you want to pray five times a day, up and down, up and down, man, you're killing yourself. One, fasting for one whole bloody month, you know, no water and no food, you know, from sunrise to center, you're killing yourself. You straight jack in your life, you can't eat the pig, you can't eat this and you can't eat that. <laughs> Hot dogs and pork chops you can't have. <laughs> this is, this is, you're killing yourself. So look, God made things easy for you. He sent his son into the world. He himself came down as a son and he died for you. And you ungrateful wretches, you want to go the hard way, sweating it out for your salvation. Jajanna, look easy for you. This is, he wants to say, convert the guy. He's already ready to receive the message. Mm -hmm. So Allah wants us to have a dialogue with him. But that dialogue is, Allah is telling you what to talk about. Not the price of oil in your country, or the price of onion or tea. No, 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 no. Allah says, what to talk about? This is what you must talk about. That we worship none but Allah, one and only God that there is. He said, no, we worship the same God. He said, which God? He said, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. His God is a triune God, three in one. He's a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So Allah tells you to tell him, Wala taqulu thalasa. Don't say Trinity. In This is, stop it, it'll be better for you. Innam Allahu ilahu wahid. For your Allah is one Allah. He's not three in one. Are you telling him that? Are we telling them that? I'm telling you, nobody. Nobody. Nobody really is doing the job. <laughs> this needs some madcaps. I'm telling you, madcaps like Ahmad Dida to do the job. I had a tablighi guy coming from Marysburg, Mr. Yusuf Goka. He's a young man, tablighi. He always comes along. He's some Darul Ulum in, in the Transvaal. When he comes to Durban, he wants to have a little brushing with me. I enjoy that. You young people coming and talking to me, I enjoy that. Wallah, can argue and debate with me? I enjoy that. So he prodded me. To say, I said, look, Yusuf, 
who is the most hated Muslim by the Christians of South Africa? He said, you. <laughs> you think I punch him on the jaw? No. He's saying halal. I said, who is the most hated Muslim by the Jews of South Africa? He said, you. Me. I'm asking, who is the most hated Muslim by the Hindus of South Africa? He said, you. No, I said, it's true. It's true. No, no. Look, haq is haq. True is true. You can all watch for that, I'm sure. You all can watch for that. I am the most hated guy by the Hindus, the Christians, and the Jews. It's true. But I said, you know, we have 500 masjids in the country with 500 imams. Every masjid has an imam. Molvi, Molana, Shaykh. No? Yes. In the Cape, here, in the Tartu, everywhere. Every masjid has an imam. I said, now, there are 500 masjids with 500 imams. Is there one of those imams hated by the Christian? One, 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 one. I want you to give me the name. I want you to tell me that so-and-so imam is hated by the Christian, or the Jew, or by the Hindu. One. Give me one in that 500. Give me one. Can you think of one? That one Muslim alim is being hated by the Hindu or the Christian or the Jew. One. Give me one name. Man, fantastic. They're all angels. The only troublemaker is Ahmad Didat. <laughs> no, amazing. No, it shows something. What? That I'm a troublemaker. I'm looking for trouble. I don't love my life. I'm 77 years old. Allah has spared me, alhamdulillah. But now I'm going to commit suicide. At this age, I'm going to commit suicide. No. You see, we have lost our mission. Our job, primary job of the Muslim is to talk, do that, invite people. That's your primary job. Invite all. Allah says, invite all to the ways of thy Lord with wisdom. Well, and with beautiful preaching. And reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. And he shows you how to do the talk. But that doesn't mean it can't create provocation. Provocation is not a test. Provocation is not a test. Because if that is the test, then our Nabi Karim Salasana was a failure. Do you know, at the age of up to the age of 40, he was loved by his people. He was respected by his people. They gave him that the mushiks gave him the title as Sadiqul Wadul Amin. A person who fulfills his promises is Sadiqul Wad. And he's Al Amin, he's the truthful, the faithful, the sincere. And that's the title they gave him before Nubuwa. When he proclaimed his mission. They want to kill him. Hmm? For 13 years, he suffered at their hands. He had to flee for his life. We are talking about the Qara Hira. Why? He didn't know how to talk. That's what he means. He, he didn't know how to talk. Look, he's provoking the people. They want to kill him. They loved him. All, 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 up to the age of 40, they loved him, and now they want to kill him. Maybe he didn't know how to talk. You know how to talk. Allah says, Lakat kana lakum fi Rasulillah uswatun hasana. Most certainly in the Apostle of Allah, you have the best example. This best example created provocation from his own people. They want to kill him. Two hijras to Abyssinia, the Sahabas made. And he had to flee for his life with everyone, lock, stock, and barrel. Everybody fled for their life to Medina. And they didn't leave him in peace even in Medina. Badar, Wahat, Khandak, war, war, war. Now in Medina, he starts with the Jews. Do you know that? Amazing, <laughs> this man. He, he, look, if you were with him, a sahaba, would you have said, Ya Rasulullah, look man, we have just run for our life from Makkah. Huh? The mushiks are still after our blood. And now you're starting with the Yahudi. Ya Rasulullah, you know, Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbi kabil hikmati. You know, invite all to the ways of the Lord with wisdom. In other words, implying he doesn't know wisdom. You know. And I said, Habi says, you know. You know wisdom. A man Abi didn't know wisdom. Now he starts with the Jews. He starts with the Christians. He starts with the Munafiks. Four different groups of people now, they want to kill him. Do you know that? Why? Because he didn't know how to talk. You are the nicest people. 500 Imams, not one is hated by anybody. One fantastic community. We are the most fantastic nation on earth. 160 million Arabs. Not one Arab is hated by the Jew or the Christian or the Hindu. Do you know that? Not one. You are fantastic people. Sab Allah wale. All godly people. No, what, what is it? No, you're not doing your job. When you do your job, you create reaction. It can't be helped. That's the nature of man. Allah describes it as Bal Nakzifu Bil Hakkal al Batil. When truth is hurled against falsehood, Bal Nakzifu Bil Hakkal al Batil, for the Mawhu Fazahu Azahikun. He said it knocks out his brains. 
When you have falsehood and I throw a at you, it destroys your falsehood. When your brain is knocked out, how do you behave? Like a saint fellow. Huh? You go besak, man. You go besak, you want to kill. That is what the mushrik will do. They kill, kill, kill. They go besak. It's haq against battle. This is the nature of haq. When you speak haq, it's going to hurt somebody. See, if I just agree with you, everything that you're doing, ditto, 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 everything I say, you say, ditto, ditto. But you are a cigarette smoker. And as soon as I touch cigarette, it's uncle, look, man, leave that out, man. You know, you keep to your religion. You know, talk about religion to people. You know, the cigarette business, why are you wasting your time? Say, look, business is business, man. Look, uncle, you keep to your religion. You know, talk to the Yahudi and the Nasara, convert them, you say, leave me alone. So, the council is also called the church for a dialogue with the followers of the prophet. Mm -hmm. So, we are looking for a dialogue. Then he says in, in his uh, beautiful volume there, describing the Muslim, he says, nevertheless, nevertheless, the religiosity of Muslims deserves respect. How nice. Your religiosity. You know, you go traveling by bus. And it's time for salad. Stop the bus, stop the bus. Come outside and there on the roadside, we make salad. Good people. Alhamdulillah. No, no, we. Good people. Miswak, miswak. <laughs> good people. Good people. No, no, I believe in miswak. I'm telling you. Look. I'm telling you, I believe in miswak. <laughs> you feel my teeth is 77. Still. Original, original, <laughs> Miswak, beautiful job. So he says, the religiosity of the Muslims deserve our respect. You know what he's saying? Now it makes me angry. Now the guy makes me angry. Religiosity, you think means religious. You think it means religious. Very good. Very good people, you tell us. Very religious people. Religiosity means it's an extreme form of piety, pretended piety, putting up a show. I'm a very good holy man. Jesus Christ called a spade a spade. He describes this, this religiosity of the Jews. He's describing in the Bible. He's telling his disciples. He said, when you fast, song, song, Rosa, when you fast, do not fast as the hypocrites do. He's telling his disciples, don't fast like the munafiks, the sheikhs and imams of the time. Don't fast like that. Don't do rosa like that. Then he explains, how do they fast? He said, they, when they fast, they don't wash their faces and they don't brush their hair. Gloomy look, gloomy look. You come to the guy, Rabbi, what's wrong? Are you feeling well? He said, no, no, I'm all right. But you see muck in his eyes, unkempt hair. You know, terrible, terrible, it's gloomy, gloomy. So what's wrong, Rabbi, Molana, Ya Sheikh, Kya baat hai, tabiat thik hai, you all right? He said, no, I'm all right, my son. But he said, you know, you look so gloomy. He said, no, my son, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. <laughs> fasting. <laughs> See, no, to create the impression, you don't wash your face with mud in the eyes and all hair unkempt. And he says, no, my son, says, I'm fasting. So you say, Mr. Didat, but Allah wala hai. He's a very, 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 very holy man. Hmm. That's the impression. So Jesus says, do not fast as the hypocrites do. They don't wash their faces and don't brush their hair. You, my disciples, when you fast, you wash your face and you brush your hair of a happy countenance that nobody suspects that you're fasting. Nobody knows because you're fasting for the love of Allah. Not for sure. He calls the hypocrite a hypocrite. The Pope calls us religiosity of the Muslims deserve our respect. <laughs> you hypocrites. He says, this hypocrisy of these guys. You know, behavior, trying to be very, very holy. Allah wala. He says, deserves respect. <laughs> I said, Your Holiness, you know, the boot is on the other foot. The boot is on the other foot. I'm reading daily in the newspapers. I don't know whether you people don't read newspapers. <laughs> That's my complaint. You people don't read newspapers. Here, Sunday Tribune, 7th of May, 95. 
It says here, Catholic priest on rape charge. New York, dateline from New York, a Catholic priest from India was arrested on Friday for allegedly trying to rape a woman in the rectory of his New York parish, police said. The Reverend Albert Fernando, 48 year old, was arraigned on charges of first degree sexual abuse, first degree attempted rape, and first degree unlawful imprisonment. He was held on a $100,000 bail. You know how much is that? That's over 300,000 rand. Who paid for that? Who paid for that? He? That guy, poor beggar from India? Huh? You call him to do service in the church? Who paid that? Where did he get the $100,000 from? Church. You, you bail him out. And after he goes through his punishment, what do you do with him? What do you do with him? Hmm? You take him back. Put him somewhere out of the way places. You don't punish him. Jesus Christ, he said, that if the eye offends you, cast it out. If the hand offends you, cut it off. That's what he's teaching. Your God, your Lord, Jesus Christ. This is what he says. If the eye offends you, cast it out. If the hand offends you, cut it off. In other words, this eyes of yours is going to cause you to lust, crave for other people's wives and daughters. That will take you to hell. Rather that I be cast out, taken out, and you rise on the other side without an eye, then this eye makes you to go to hell. This hand of yours can't resist touching other people's wives and daughters. This hand will take you to hell. Rather you cut it off. And I have here, I had a story here just now. A young girl in Pretoria, of a Pretoria here. Hmm. And I, I don't know that I should read all these things to you. Sis. I don't know that I should read it to you. Newspapers, man, newspapers is, is being thrown at you. This is from uh, the February news, February 18, 1995. It says here, Dateline from Pretoria, penis cutting daughter held. A daughter who cut off her father's private part. The father, he says, is telling his daughter, this is in the article. He says, you know my child, telling his daughter, I can't resist molesting children. It's my, this body, this flesh of mine is such, I can't resist. So help me, for God's sake, help me. Christ said, cut it off. I said, help me, cut it off. And the daughter did her father a favor. She cut it off. Now, the guy's in trouble. So he said, no, a gang came and they just cut it off. Three days time, he died. He died in three, bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. Not a surgical cut. You know, just with a butcher knife, you know, she just cut it off. Now the daughter goes to court to the police and says, look, this is what I did. I cut off my father's penis. Because this is what he cried to me. He said, help me. He doesn't want to burn in hell. He'd rather be without that here. He's following the teachings of Jesus to the letter. You have your holiness in America at the present moment. At the present moment. There are cases going on against the Roman Catholic Church. In the Time magazine, after the fall, after the fall, these are pictures here of the Roman Catholic priests who have been charged for sodomizing little boys, choir boys in the church. Father, Father J John Henton Han Han in Plymouth Superior Court last week, as he was sentenced to three concurrent life terms, he will be eligible for parole in 15 years' time. Father, Roman Catholic Church. And in this article, it says, $500 million worth of claims are, 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 are made against the Roman Catholic Church for the priests sodomizing choir boys. You talk about the religious of the Muslims. We don't say we are angels. Wallah, we are not angels. We have black sheep among us as well. We have devils also among us. But man, you take the bun. You take 
500 million, half a billion dollars worth of claims. So now in England, they passed a law. They're passing a law now, the church. Said every person who wants to become a priest, we want to go into his life history. You must ask him, did you molest any children at any time? Did anybody ever accuse you? <laughs> Everything about you. Because this is now the insurance companies don't want to pay. So now, Ben, tell me about $500 million worth of claims against your church for sodomizing little boys. Huh? And you call religiosity of the Muslim deserves our respect. <laughs> we deserve your respect, our religiosity. So we said, you see, the boot is on the other foot. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, look, it's a fantastic opportunity, Wallah. See, Allah is giving us opportunity. Wallah, he's giving me this opportunity. This book, you know, was written for me. Do you know that? Allah made him to write this book for me. I'm telling you. Because no other Muslim can use this book. And I can use this book. His book, everything, his, every word he uses, I can use it to expound my religion. I'm going to England on the 30th of August on a lecture tour about the same, about the book. His Holiness, Islam's answer to the Pope's pious pronouncement. Lecture, lecture, lecture. This book, I'm telling you, it was written for me. You say no. Then I say, you tell me, who was it written for? You see, when this Pope, you know, and I, we were having a, con a communication. He was talking about having a dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. So I wrote to him, I said, Your Holiness, I'm prepared to accept that dialogue. I want to come along to the Vatican at your disposal, at your convenience. When can we have it? Your Bible says, come, let us reason together. And the Quran says, Alal Kitab Ta'ala. So both religions saying, come, let us talk. We want to talk. And it's a long story. It's a long story. Eventually, I found a picture where he actually shows His Holiness the Pope, you know, playing hide and seek. You must have seen that picture. You must have seen that picture. This one here. You saw this picture? We gave out quarter million men in English and quarter million in Arabic. And you haven't seen it. I know you people don't read. <laughs> this picture here. See, I don't want to show you what he's doing because these guys are catching me on the camera. And then they're going to show that is playing the game like that. I don't want people to use that picture at any time. Therefore, I'm not doing it. But fortunately, I found it as I showed it to you. See what the Pope is doing? So in Victoria Street, there was a pharmacy there that white man, I forget his name. He's a good friend of mine. Every time in the city hall I have a lecture, he's the first man to come and ask me a question. First man in every lecture. He's the first guy to come along to ask questions. Do you know that? I forget his name. He's the chemist owner. He's not there anymore now. He's somewhere else. So I go to him. You know, he's my friend. We have a brushing. So I show him the picture. He said, where did you get this? Where did you get this? I said, look, don't worry about that. I said, this picture was taken for me. This picture was taken for me. He says, no. It's not for, for me. I said, you, you need this picture? Do you need a picture like this of your Pope? Playing monkey tricks. You want, you want your Pope like this? Huh? He says, no. I said, is there a single Christian who needs a picture like this? A picture like this? A single Christian who would want to see his Pope like this, behaving like this? He says, no. So I said, look, I needed a picture like that. So the picture is taken for me. No, Allah is Musa Bibbala's part. He creates this. He doesn't know. Everybody is set up. Everybody gets set up. You get set up. Allah is setting up everybody. He set me up for this. Wallah. He set me up for this. If I tell you now how that, that book came into my hand, how, how? It's a setup. Everything is a setup. Me going to Marisburg and spending the whole day there is a setup. Everything is a setup. I'm here. It's a setup. This is what Allah does to everybody. Let's hope that we cooperate with this setting up and do some service to Islam. With these words, Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters, I'm very, very grateful that on this nice, lovely day, you have been able to come and honor me. May Allah reward you all. And uh, this lecture, my usual, all my talks are followed by questions and answers. You have questions, please queue up here. Queue up here. Don't drag your feet. Come, let us finish it early. I think I have taken a lot of time of yours tonight. A lot more than normally I give.
come forward, ask your questions, and uh, we'll end with the dua at the end. Come. If there's anybody who has any questions, please come forward. We have one listed there. My name is Rashid Ahmed. Mr. Didat, I want to ask you uh, one question or more. Is, uh, I want to ask you who said that uh, there will be no sign shown to you unless the sign of Jonah. I want to answer me that first. Then I'll come to another thing. Oh, sit down. Sit down, please. No, that was a statement made by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ made that statement. See, the Jews came to him and said, Master, Mfundesi, si tanda, ugobona, isibona galiso, esenzive, go away. So, Master, we would have a sign of thee. We want you to show us a miracle to convince us that you are the man we are waiting for. Uche suwa pendula wagu wati gubo. Isi zugulwan esi bi nisi pingayo. Si funa isi bonagaliso. Gepa asi igu nigwa si bonagaliso. Kupela isi bonagaliso. Kuka chonam prophet. They shall no sign be given unto it. An evil and adulterous generation seek it after a sign, but they shall no sign be given unto it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. In Afrikaans, once was Jonah, dree da and dree nachta, in the heart and the hood this was. So shall the sin from the man's dree da and dree nachta, in the heart and the heart this. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. That was said by Jesus. Now, you see, I was just trying to show you that if you want to do a job, you take the trouble. You want to sell something. Yeah. Our forefathers, our forefathers were business people. They started opening little shops and they learned Zulu. You know that? They learned Zulu. So this is Savana Baba, Mama, you know, Shipile. They learned all that to do business. Right? But we are not learning Zulu. You know why? Because you don't want to do the dawa. Hmm? You can be an imam. You, you, you. I'm pointing at you now. You can be an imam for a hundred years. Just for example. Don't take offense. But you'll never learn to say Sagabona to the African. That's your nature. You'll never learn in a hundred years to say Sagabona. I know, you know that. Our Mulvis, our Alims, our Lamas, in a hundred years, if they live for a thousand years, they won't learn to say Sagabona. Do you know that? And Allah says, wish everyone you know and wish everyone you don't know. And be the foremost in wishing people. But it's not a part of your life. Yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm from Cape Town. Ashallah. I'm a truck driver. I'm just driving through. Right. And I received this um, invitation Meeting. on uh, Lovely. 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 Now, uh, I'm a Christian. And I would like to ask you uh, one question that is, why after, since 1948, the 14th of May, when the, the Jews went back to Israel, Israel, they became a, Israel became a nation and all that. I would love to know, since that time, they have fought seven wars. Right. All seven have been won by the Jews. Right. And uh, I would love to know why is it that the, that country is surrounded by the Arab states? 160 million Muslims. Yes. And they ain't able to overpower a, a country with 140,000 soldiers in the army. Why is that, Mr. I'll give you an easy answer. Sit down, sit down, yes. You know, Smith in Southern Rhodesia, he declared the UDI, Unilateral Declaration of Independence. You remember that? For 12 years, he made the whole of Africa to say, hey, you bloody rubbish, stand afar, don't come near. And there were only quarter million, do you know that? Do you, do you know that there are only quarter million whites in Southern Rhodesia? And they had the whole of Africa, your Nigeria, and your Ghana, and your Malawi, and whole band, lot of us, 
whole bang lot of us. Keep it arm's length, you're bloody rubbish. For 12 years, he kept us there. No, he's the armory, weapons. That guy has got the weaponry. America is behind him. Every time the Muslim goes to war against the Jew, he's not fighting the Jew, he's fighting America. In 1973, for the first time, for the first time, the Arabs took the initiative. The Ramadan war, the October war, Sadat crossed the Barlev line, he had the Jews by the throat. And the Jews cried. Cried for help. And Regan rushed into the battle with his men and machines through the Azores, direct into the battlefield. So we are not fighting the Jews. This is Jewish is a facade, it's a front. We are actually fighting America. Inshallah, say God willing, one day, things will come right. They're working, working. Today, little children are facing them with stones. That spirit will win. This is what God wants. The spirit is the spirit that's going to win. The guy's giving in. His own says, all right, now, man, you have a little peace here, a little peace there. His nation says, no. But he still says, no, he knows which side his bread is buttered. So we said, now leave it to God. God in his wisdom, he's got his plan. Is a purification for us. We need purification. You see, we are not altogether pure. We have to be purified. In our intentions and our spirit, we have to be purified to get victory. It'll take time, but inshallah, it's working. It'll work. Like it happened here in Rhodesia. They got the independence. But for 12 years, Smith, Smith, with his quarter million, he had the whole of Africa. How many? 200 million Africans at bay. Hmm? Or 300 million Africans. Say, you bloody rubbish, keep out. Keep out of my country. And a quarter million at that. So it is the armament, it's the weapon that did the job. Same thing here. 300 years, the guy ruled us. 300 years. What did it? Is he more than you? No. Is he stronger than you? No. No. It's a weapon. He had the arms. So. Fortunately, thank God, uh, the Russians said, well, we'll help the uh, ANC. And Libya says, we'll help you. And so on says, we'll help you. Uh, China says, we'll help you. And over a period of time, we got our independence with all this help. One day, inshallah, this Middle East will also come right. Any other question? Yes. Uh, sorry, you just mentioned uh, the Chinese and the Russians and all and the Libyans, and Libya, and all these right. people coming, uh, promising aid to the ANC and helping them to liberate the oppressed. Uh, what I'm, I want to come to a point here that is, do you expect the same thing to happen in the Middle East? A country like Russia with an army of about 400 million, it's a very strong army, I know about them, and I also know that there's about 80 to 90 percent of the soldiers is Muslim. Yes. About 80 to 90 percent of the Russian army soldiers is Muslim. Because there are a lot of Muslims staying in Russia. And I also have learned, as you might possibly know, that in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet prophesies about the Russian army coming up against Israel, assisting the Kanda, the Arab nations surrounding Israel to overpower, to, in actual fact, win the war they many years want to win, that is to get Israel out of, uh, to get the Jews out of Israel. What I want, what I'm saying, Mr. Didat, is this. Is that war going to happen? You know that Ezekiel in the chapter 38, prophesize about that. Is that war going to happen? Do you expect uh, um, America, as you have just said, to intervene and help the Israelis in that war? You see, my son, I don't live in false hopes, these prophecies. People have been waiting for Jesus Christ to come. You know that? For 2,000 years. It was any time, any time now. He said, before you go over the cities of Israel, I'll be back. He's telling his disciples, when they persecute you in one city, flee into another. And they persecute you, flee into another. And before you go over the cities of Israel, I'll be back. 
And they fled and they fled and they died and they rotted in their graves. 2,000 years have gone and it still hasn't come yet. So I don't believe in waiting with open mouth for somebody to come along and pull the chest out of the fire for you. We have to learn to, to do it ourselves, to get the things ourselves. So time will come, but we don't sit on prophecies. See, the Christian was waiting and still waiting 2,000 years now for Jesus Christ. He said, before you go over, I'll be back. So same thing happened to the Jews in the, in, the, in, in the book of Exodus. God speaks to them. He says, I declare to you this day that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land which you are going over the Jordan to, 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 to cross and, 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 and to conquer. You will not live long in that land. That's your Bible. That's a prophecy. But I said, tell the Muslims, I said, no, don't wait on that. You have to learn to get the things that you want. You have to pay for it. You have to sweat for it. Don't wait for things to happen from heaven because heaven doesn't work that way. It wants you to sweat and God will give you the reward. Any other questions? This will be the last question. This will be the last question. Mr. Dillon, uh, I've got a simple question for you. Since the duty of Dawa to the people is an obligation upon the Muslims, and we find that uh, there's an opposition from the, among our Muslim brothers that is not good to do so, is it because they're ignorant about Dawa or they want to live in peace with the non-Muslim brothers? If not, then why is that like that? You see, to me, we are not told. We are not told. Nowhere have I found the Muslims in the Muslim world telling the people, they say, go and do dawah. The alims, I'm talking about the alims. They'll tell you about the beard, the size of your beard. Yours is not standard size. Me too, me too, me too. I'm here in the same boat as you. You see? So you're wearing Nasara clothes? Me too, me too. You see? So we are busy with that. We are busy with that. Nobody is telling you to do dawah. This is the awful fard of the Muslim, the first fard. Long before Salat, Zakat, Hajj, and Sawm became fard, Allah tells His Rasul, our Nabi Kareem, Sallallahu the Holy Prophet Muhammad. And through Him, He's telling us, He says, Fazakir innama anta muzakir. So you deliver the message because it is your duty to deliver the message. Lasta alayhim in Musaitir, you will not be questioned regarding them. Illa man tawalla wa kafar. Why they accepted or why they didn't accept, Allah won't ask you. He will ask you, did you deliver the message? And if we can say, Ya Bari Ta'ala, we tried to the best of our ability. If that was very little or great, whatever, you tried, Allah will say, my Jannah is open for you. He will not ask you, why didn't you do like Ahmad did that? I'm telling you, he won't ask you that. Why didn't you do like Mawlana Razak? Mm -hmm. He won't ask you that. He said, did you? He said, yes, Ya Bari Ta'ala. What little I knew, I tried. He said, yeah. But if you can say that, I don't know how many of us can say that, that we tried. We are not trying. We are not talking. We are not told. The islands are not telling you from the member. They must tell you from the member. Me, this is my job, my occupation. So what can I do? I have to talk about these things. Say, I'm making money. This is my occupation. We are worth 20 million. So the guy is very lucky. Huh? Yeah, that's a very lucky fellow. <laughs> no, no, my brothers. There is a law at work. There is a law at work. You have to pay the price. See, all what I'm telling you, I can give you 20 different languages. Do you know that? <coughs> Exotic languages. The language of the Dinka, which nobody heard. Even the Sudanese don't know. They are at war with the Dinkas. They are like the Zulus in southern Sudan. John Karam is a Dinka. I learned his language before going to Sudan. I learned Swahili. I know Indonesian, I know Malaysian, I know French, and I'm trying to learn Italian now <laughs> because I got an Italian book of the Pope. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to learn Italian. So if I meet an Italian, I says, you know, uh, His Holiness the Pope, he says, but I'll be telling in Italian. He says, so some of the most beautiful names in the human language are given to the God of the Quran. Beautiful, beautiful. Did you read the Quran? So, Get started, man. You see, if you want to deliver a message, you'll have that to do something. That means you're paying the price. Ah, by the way, I didn't bring it to show you people. These are all the cards. These are all the cards. This verse I read to you tonight is, 
إذ هما في الغار إذ يقول لصاحبه لا تهزن إن لن لها معنا what I'm learning at the age of 77 I'm learning are you prepared to make that sacrifice no you just see say the guy's very lucky man hey he's very he's got a nice jetta <laughs> no my dear brothers there is a price you have to pay anybody everybody there's nothing for nothing in life you are a parasite if you expect things to happen to you. people throwing down manna and salva from heaven Allah doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. Those days are gone. You have to sweat for whatever you get. So, this Jazakallah. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the talk for the evening. I'd like to thank you for coming here this evening. More than that, I'd like to thank Mr. Ahmadidat for a very informative talk. And before we close this evening's proceedings, a dua would be read. Al-Fatiha. <coughs> Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa barq wa sallim. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanata wa fi al-akhirati hasanata wa qin adab al-nar. Rabbana la tuzakkulu bana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahmatan inna kantal wahab. Allahumma inna ka'afuun karimun tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afwana ya karim. اللهم من أحييته منا فأحيه على الإسلام ومن توفيته منا فتوفه على الإيمان اللهم إنا بما سأل منه الرسول من خير فقير وما استعاذ منه الرسول من شر نستعيد إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم سبحان ربنا رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين Pray that your name will be praised on every continent, on every country, in every language, and every town, Lord Jesus. That your name will be praised. Jesus, we love you. For you're so real and you're so true. We're so thankful to testify this with each other, with our brothers and sisters. God, we dedicate this time into your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to extend a welcome to you this evening, welcoming the students that are here in this space, welcoming all of the students across the country who are participating online. It is my privilege this evening to provide some context to what's been happening in this space over the last couple of weeks. On February 8th, right here, a regularly scheduled chapel service never ended. And in addition,
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ترحب دائرة الشؤون الإسلامية والأوقاف بالشارقة بالشيخ أحمد ديدات والحضور الكريم The Department of Islamic Affairs and Awqaf welcomes Sheikh Ahmed Didat and the, uh, the, uh, all the who comes to this meeting. And we invite Mr. Abdul Salam Abdul Sattar Muslim to criticize over and conduct the meeting. Gentlemen, before uh, beginning the meeting formally, may I invite Sheikh Ahmed Didab to come to the stage and uh, present, grace us with this occasion. I would now request Sheikh Taha Ashur to come to the stage and recite a passage from the Holy Quran. Sheikh Taha Ashur. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
First of all, our apologies to Shaykh Ahmad Ida and to you all that due to some unexplained reasons, today's talk could not be publicized properly. Nevertheless, it is heartening to see and a tribute to the regard Sheikh Ahmed Didat enjoys amongst Muslims all over the world that we find a respectable audience, rather that this hall is full to capacity. It is said that one man's loss is another man's gain. This proverb has proved true for the presence of Shaykh Ahmad Didar in our midst today is our gain against the loss of Nigeria where he was supposed to be lecturing this evening. But it appears that Nigeria was intent on settling this loss and the providence in response to our prayers sent him to us. As we had not had the pleasure of his eloquent discourse for quite some time. Beginning his life in a country store next to a missionary training center, Shaykh Ahmed Dida got his first insight into Christianity and the techniques employed by them for conversion and propagation. It spurred him to a deeper study of Islam to provide rebuttal to false allegations against and answers to misleading criticism often levied on our faith by adversaries. Alone and practically without any means, he took up the Kadgal, lecturing, debating, comparing and challenging other faiths. He challenged the very basis of Christianity in asking, was Christ crucified? Is Bible the word of God? And so on. He demolished Dr. Sharosh in what's God's word, Quran or the Bible. He defeated Robert Douglas on crucifixion and brought Jimmy Swaggart to his doom and has challenged the Vatican. Sheikh Ahmad Didar has stunned the Christian community, proved the banality and falsehood of other beliefs 
that go by the name of religion. And is South Africa's first high technic Muslim missionary to spread the message of Islam all around the world. She has won King Faisal Award for his services to Islam and humanity. This valiant son of Islam is in our midst today and he will speak to us on Islam in Africa. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the lecture. So I respectfully request you all to kindly hear him with patience and attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Sheikh Ahmad Dida. الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولن ترضى أنك اليهود ولا النصارى حتى تتبع ملتهم صدق الله صدق الله مولانا زين Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters before I get into the topic of this evening I'll just give you a brief translation of what I read to you. In the Holy Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, that is chapter 2, ayah number 120, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us an eternal reminder about the relationship between us, the Muslims, and the Jews and the Christians. He says, وَلَن تَرْضَى أَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّةً That the Jews and the Christians will never, never be satisfied with you, O Muslims, until you follow their brand of religion. There is no peace for you. If you want peace, go and opt out of Islam and become a Jew. If you want peace, become a Christian or bring them into Islam. There's no sitting on the fence. Either you change them or they change you, otherwise there is no peace. That is the message of this Quranic ayah I read to you. Now coming to Dubai. As our chairman said, one man's misfortune is somebody else's good fortune. My president, F.W.D. Clerk, he went to Nigeria. I read this when I'm in the Sudan, more about Sudan later, but in the Sudan. That the clerk, the oppressor, the one who oppressed the black people for 300 years, who created the system of apartheid, keeping people apart racially, that after 300 years of oppression, now this man goes out and is welcomed into Nigeria with a 21-gun salute. I don't know whether you know. That is the highest tribute you can pay to any royalty or anybody, any ruler, any dignity. If the Queen of England went to Nigeria, she can't get 22-gun salute. She'll still have highest 21. So this oppressor, from my country is welcomed into Nigeria with a 21 gun salute. And he opened the doors for all South Africans. See, it made me happy in a way. Because for 15 years I was sweating to get a visa into Nigeria, the Muslim country of Nigeria. In 1977, in Riyadh, at a WAMI conference, World Assembly of Muslim Youth. They gave me a ticket to go to Nigeria. What for? This is the Christian missionaries have run amok. They're running wild. There's a killing field in Nigeria. A small group of Christians called Jehovah's Witnesses. They do not number two million in the world today. They started about a hundred years ago, a sect. 
called Jehovah's Witnesses. They are boasting in their magazine called Awake in 1976 that the second highest number of Jehovah's Witnesses in the world outside the United States, where they started 100 years ago, is the Muslim country of Nigeria. The second highest number of Jehovah's Witnesses in the world outside America is the Muslim country of Nigeria. And they are boasting in that magazine that we have 112,000 active workers, Mujahids, Crusaders in Nigeria. And we will have to admit that though today we are the one billion Muslims in the world, we can't produce 10,000 dais. Do you know that? We can't produce 10,000 people who do dawah, propagating Islam to the non-Muslim. We can't produce 10,000. And this little sected group in Nigeria alone, they are boasting 112,000 mujahids, crusaders. So they say, please, go and help our brethren in Nigeria. To me, it was a privilege. I got the ticket. 15 years, no visa. 15 years, no. The Nigerians, they meet me, good people, wallah, good Muslims. They meet me in Mecca, in Medina, in Jeddah, or any conferences everywhere, and they embrace me, and they say, why don't you come to my country? Why don't you come to our country? I say, get me the visa. Get me the visa. No visa. 15 years. Now, when I get the news that the clerk, through the help of the Jews in Nigeria, they have got the embassy there now, in conniving with the Christians in Nigeria, they were able to get this Christian oppressor into the country. And he opened the door for me. So I make a beeline for the Nigerian embassy in Sudan, in Khartoum. I said, look, my de clerk is welcomed into your country with a 21 gun salute. I don't want any gun salute. I just want to get into Nigeria. He said, look, we have just got a circular telling us that all South Africans from now on will be welcome into Nigeria. I said, right, give me a visa. So our brother, he gave me a visa. It's here in the book. And he did one thing extra. After stamping the visa, he put another stamp saying gratis, means free. Bakshish, no charge. I am a VIP, very important person. Alhamdulillah. So I got the visa. And I make a beeline. I return home, and from there I make a beeline for Nigeria. 15 years of effort. Now, Allah has now <laughs> paid me for it. The thing is done now, the door is open. So, from Durban to London, and London to Kano. I land in Kano, the Muslim majority area in the north. There's a Kano state, and the city also is a city of Kano. I land in Kano. I get into the terminal building and I get a welcome from the officers there, you know, with all the badges. Come, come, one side, one side. VIP treatment, I think, one side. People, they recognize me, Mr. Dida, Mr. Dida, they want to come along. And, mm -hmm. They say, no, no, shh, don't come anywhere near Mr. Dida. Maybe they're trying to protect me from my fans. At times, that's necessary. Your passports, please. So my passport and my son's passport and another companion from England, three passports we hand it over. Maybe for special treatment. Don't waste your time in the queue. Special treatment. After half an hour, they come back with a cyclostyle document that you are a prohibited immigrant. I said, I don't, I'm not an immigrant. I don't want to come into your country. I'm only a visitor, I'm a tourist. I want to come and help my brothers. This is no, you're not allowed. Here it is the officer, you know, in charge of the immigration, his past is judgment. But the people who are giving me this notification, they're crying. The Muslim who's doing the job, he's crying. They're crying, Allah, they're crying. Tears, genuine tears. What can we do? We are slaves. We have to listen, obey the orders of our superiors. If not, we'll be fired. Here. They're crying. So 
They stop the plane, don't let the plane go until these guys are put back onto the plane, back onto the plane, 18 hours total flight, make a good run, one tawaf, and back to London. What shall I do? I promised my family two, two weeks. I want permission, two weeks. They gave me permission, two weeks. In two days, I'm back in London, completed the circle. What shall I do? Return home? Or where? So I phoned Abu Dhabi. I said, look, I'm here. What do you suggest? He says, please, come to the UAE. Ahlan wa sahlan. I ring up Dubai. I said, ahlan wa sahlan. Please, as a visa. No problem. So I'm here. I'm here. The newspapers, naturally, they want to know anybody coming in. They want to know interview. They want news. So I get the reporters coming along and I give an interview about exactly what I told you. I said, look, I have been kicked out, footballed, blackballed out of Nigeria and they kicked me so hard I landed in the UAE. Hmm? I'm quite happy, but now I said, look, I landed here and the world must know that the Muslim country of Nigeria, they allowed the oppressor as they welcome him with a 21 gin salute, but a Muslim brother wants to go in and he is kicked out. The world ought to know, the people in the UAE wants to know, I'm sure the whole Muslim world wants to know why this Didat got kicked out of Nigeria. He landed there and football. Why? So the interview is given. I show the interviewer the passport, I show him the visa, he takes a picture. And he produces the picture. With the, the story I told him, nothing to do with the story. Here is a picture in color. They did me a favor in technical, four color job. Ahmad Dida showing the passport, the visa. The picture is there. But what is the story about? What does it say? The heading it says, Rushdi is a hypocrite, says Dida. <laughs> surprising. I'm telling people, look, I'm telling you now, I don't kick dead donkeys. The thing, a donkey that is dead, I don't go and kick the donkey. That's a disgrace on me, man. Wasting my energy on a dead donkey. The guy's finished, he's gone. So Rushdi, he's finished. You know, he must be cursing the day he was born. Now you want me to go and kick him? You want me to go and kick him? I give battle to living people. I said, the Pope, come, come, come. You want to have a dialogue? Come. Have a dialogue with you. Jimmy Swagger says, come. Who? Who? Who wants to talk to me? Come. I offered my services in, 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 in Malaysia. All the bishops, whoever you are, whatever church or denomination, please come and have a dialogue with me. I want to talk. Everybody's talking about dialogue. The Pope says, dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. I said, come, let's have a dialogue. And all get cold feet. I don't go and kick dead donkeys. So I found the Gulf News. And I want to know now. Where does Rushdie fit in? It is me who's blackballed from Nigeria. I'm kicked from all over from there to land in Dubai. That is news. Did I barred from Nigeria? That's news. I'm sure you'd like to know that. What happened? Why? And there's nothing about it. Not one word. The passport shows. What am I showing the passport for? Not one word. So I phone as I want to know who is responsible for this. So they tell me there is Mr. Disa. He is the deputy night editor of the Gulf News. So I'd like to speak to Mr. Disa. Mr. Disa, I thought Lisa, you know, Mona Lisa. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I said now. What are you? Mr. Disa said, where you come from? This sound is Gabriel, Jibreel, is Jibreel. He's Gabriel, he said Jibreel, is Jibreel Disa. So I'm asking him, I says, what is this, man? I'm showing the passport, I'm talking about the passport, and you talk about Rushdie. No connection whatsoever. He said, look, the Khalid time had touched it, the subject. So therefore, we won't touch it. Is that what you do? There are so many things. Bosnia, what's happening in Bosnia? Because the Khalid time has it, I won't have it. Is that your policy? Rajanish, Rajanish died. 
that confidence trickster in America, and you had a two page full from one end to the other his history. So Khalish time, if it has it, you won't have it. Is that the case? Murarji Desai. Murarji Desai. My mamu. My maternal uncle. Yes, yes. You know, he's my nation. Actually, he's my nation. Murarji Desai. We speak the same language. There are Muslim Desais, Hindu Desais. Muslim Patels, Hindu Patels. Muslim Bhula, Hindu Bhula. I am a Banya Musalma, me. Muraji Desai is my Mamu. Look, he's a Hindu, he's a Mushrik, but I can't say, look, he's not my nation. He's my nation, he's my race, he's my blood relation. Ethnically, we are one people. Muraji. And they put the news about him that he is, he is promoting self-urine therapy in the Gulf News, meaning you drink your own piss. He says, Morar Gides, and my mom says, that is good for you. It's good for cataract. You don't only have that parda coming over your eyes, cataract, and it's good for tuberculosis. And he's telling the Christians, he says, you too, you must drink your urine, because the Bible says so. Your holy Bible says, you must drink your own piss. So where did you get that? And he quotes the Bible. Moraji Desai, who quotes the Holy Bible, saying the Bible says, drink water from your own cistern. So what is cistern? You know the tank in the toilet. You press the chain and it takes away all the rest. It's a cistern. So he says, what is cistern? He says, cistern means your bladder. So it means drink water. It means drink water from your own cistern, means from your own kidneys, meaning your own piss. You Christians, you better do the same because that's what your Holy Bible says. And that's news, cult news. But Ahmad did that being black ball, no, they won't touch it. So I said, now, look, I want to know who's superior to you. You are Gabriel Disa. I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from India. I said, India? That's where I come from. Where about in India? He said, Goa. He said, I said, you are a Goanese. He said, no, 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 I'm a Goan. Not a Guanese. I said, okay, you're a Guan. Go ahead. Go ahead. I said, now, nah, who is your superior? I want to talk to him of what you have done to the news. He says, he is Mr. Nahal Canera. Canera. I said, Primo Canera. I remember the guy. He was one time the heavyweight champion boxer of the world. He was an Italian, almost seven foot giant. The tallest boxer who ever won the championship of the world was Primo Canera. I don't know those who follow. I was a young man, I was following all these things, you know, Primo Canera. I said, Canera? Italian? He said, no, 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 no. He's a Sri Lankan. I said, oh, how do you spell it? He says, K-A-N-E-I-R-A, Canera, not C-A-N-E-R-A, Canera. I said, oh, I'm asking, is he a Christian or a Buddhist? He said, I don't know. I said, now please don't tell me that. A Christian, you're working with a, another person for so many years as your superior, and you don't even ask him whether he's a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Christian or a Muslim. You never asked him, you don't know. The guy starts getting rough with me. He says, now this old man, what can he do now? <laughs> I said, now who is superior to him? I'm finding out who are the people there in the Gulf News who are controlling the newspaper. So I found the guy who footballed me in the Gulf News was a Christian from India, from Goa, and his superior happens to be a, a Buddhist. I found out later he's a Buddhist. Then the night editor is Rama Chandra, a Hindu, and a general manager is a Chandra Rai, another Hindu. And marketing manager is a Duli George, maybe a Christian or a Hindu. And who's the circulation manager? Mr. Vikram Dar, another Hindu. 100%! The whole thing is in charge, but who is the head? Who is the owner? Oh, then you find out that, you know, our oh, Muslim brother is the owner. He is the owner. The owner is Brother Umaid, Sheikh Ubaid, who made a tire. So I'd like to speak to him. 
I want to speak to the owner now. Because everything, the Hindus and the Christians are controlling the whole newspaper. I want to know, my brother, that, do you know what's going on? What they're doing to me? I only want to cry. I want my brothers to sympathize with me for being footballed out of Nigeria. That's all. I wanted nothing more than that. I don't want you to apply sanctions against Nigeria, that you stop your trade relationship with Nigeria, nothing of the kind. I just want the people to know that I'm hurt. That is all. So, Brother Ubaid, who made a tire, they tell me that he's gone to South Africa. <laughs> no, they say, say, what an irony, imagine. I said, look, if I had known, uh, the, the team of businessmen from Abu Dhabi, I'm sorry, from Dubai, they have gone to South Africa. At the moment, they are receiving the hospitality of the South African government. The same white man who has been oppressing us, and he is welcoming our team from here. I said, nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that. They're enjoying the hospitality of the white man. I said, if I was there, I would have welcomed you. Welcome them all. Ahlan wa sahlan. What a beautiful expression. This morning's paper in the Khalid Times, you read that tourists are finding themselves very, very accommodated here. Tourists. And they're flocking in, alhamdulillah. Good business. Good for business. Tourists. And the heading says, that the tourists are coming because of the hospitality, our hospitality, says Ahmad. Says, it only says in the headline, says Ahmad says that it is our hospitality that is bringing people in. I find out who is this Ahmad? This is a Sheikh Ahmad bin Sayyid al Maktoum. I said, How did you get this hospitality? It's a part of the Arab nature. Where did you get it? It is your expression, ahlan wa sahla. Anytime, this creates a mentality, ahlan wa sahla. The most beautiful words of welcome in any language. Ahlan wa sahla, family and play. Just think that you are a member of the family and be at ease. You, there's no formalities required from you. Sit down, man, sit down. Make yourself feel at home. If you want to pick your nose, go ahead and do it. You don't have to make and no protocols, no pretenses. Ahlan, as you are a member of the family. And sahl, ease. Like in the army or the, or the boy scouts, they say, stand at ease. Now you can scratch your head, you can scratch your beard, you can do what you like. That is Ahlan wa sahlan. That is your approach to everybody. Alhamdulillah is creating this feeling. But the hospitality which I'm seeing from the Gulf news is not that type of hospitality. I want to see somebody whenever Brother Obed comes. He's coming on Sunday, by the way. I'm leaving tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock. If I was here, if I had a chance, I would go and meet him and ask him for an explanation. I says, Hindus, 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 Christians, Buddhists. I mean, the whole thing is controlled. I want to know who is the owner and are you responsible? As a Muslim, are you responsible or not for the behavior? What they're doing to your brother? For what reason? Why can you ask them any questions? I want to know. I want to find out from my brothers here, if there is a local, a person who is a local, I don't like that term local, I don't like that term. It's botany or something, whatever, they'll have to think, you people have to think. It's not a good word, I don't like it, local. It's the same thing as a native, he's a native, of the, he's a native. Whenever we say native, we think of African. When you say local, I don't know what you think of, local, what do you mean local? Think, 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 think of a word, something better than the word local, maybe an Arabic word, which might give you a description of what you are, the people of the land. You are the, the person who is welcoming the other person. I'm sure there's a word for that. Huh? No, no, these are all citizens. This must be something special to say, I am a special citizen who is here to welcome the foreigner, the outsider. That's some word. I want a local, no insult. I'm not trying to insult anybody. I want a local who can assure me that he's prepared to go and present my case to Brother Ubaid. I don't know if there is a brother who can tell me, said, look, I have the guts to go along. I don't want you to go with a gun or with a knife, go and fight him. I don't want any fighting. Just go and put my case to him. He said, look, brother, what is this going on in your newspaper? Is there a local here? I hope you understand my English. Local person, a Dubaian, a person from Dubai, a native of Dubai. Is there one who's prepared to go along and cry for me to Sheikh Ubaid? 
please put up your hand. Jazakallah, brother. Jazakallah, brother. Please. please. I, would, I would like my brother, before he goes, to give your name and your address and your telephone number. And I assure you, the next time I come, I'd like to have a cup of tea with you. The subject, Islam in Africa, that is the topic. South Africa, people are rushing. There's money to be made there. South Africa happens to be one of the richest pieces of real estate in the world. Real estate, you know, land mass with this diamond and gold and coal and natural resources, water and land. Beautiful. Cheap labor, Allah, it's a heaven on earth. We, with all the oppression, we don't want to leave the place. <laughs> you know, Allah, if they offered me in Saudi Arabia, I said, look, come and live in Saudi Arabia. And we give you a palace here in Saudi Arabia, condition, and we give you $10,000 a month, <laughs> and a condition palace, You come and live here, the condition you live here. Thank you very much. That hell in South Africa is better than your heaven. Allah, I mean it. Your country, look, it's a holy land. Beautiful place. But when I come out, I have to look like this. You know, the glare of the sun, sand, dry dead sand, black burnt mountains. I don't know whether if you went to Hajj or Umrah, when you pass from Jidda to <laughs> Makkah or to Medina, what do you see? Burnt rocks. All the rocks are black. Sand is not the pure desert sand you think of. Imagine golden sand, nothing of the kind. Black burnt sand over a period of millions of years and this glaring sun. You know, the way you. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. That hell in South Africa is more palatable to me than your heaven in Saudi Arabia. So I'm not here to sell you South Africa. I'm telling you. It has riches you can't imagine. I don't want to give you details. I told you diamond and gold and coal and other natural resources. If they just open the door to India, the whole of India will be there. If they open it to the Pakistan, the whole of Pakistan will be there. If they open it to the whole of Africa, the whole of Africa will be there. I'm telling you. I don't know about the Dubaians. I don't know about the Dubaians. You have a heaven of your own here. That's different. But I tell you, whole of Asia will be there. If they just say, Ahlan wa sahlan. Like the Arabs say, Ahlan wa sahlan. If that can come say, anybody, Ahlan wa sahlan, shoot. There won't be place for us to breathe, to walk. I'm not selling South Africa. But there is another commodity in South Africa which we can describe as black gold. Black gold. We have gold and diamond and coal, but now I'm talking about black gold. Can you think what it is? Huh? The Zulus. Huh? Zulus. Zulus. <laughs> yes, the population. The population. Then the Zulus. There are some over 20 million Africans. Among them, there are 8 million Zulus. The Zulus are the most militant community in that part of the world. One of the biggest cohesive force, united force in that part of the world. You want to go and do business with a white man? You want to be a partner in the exploitation of the black man? You will have the money, I'm telling you. But sooner or later, as soon as the African comes to his, stands on his feet, he says, you, Arab slave trader, you have been, that's what the white man has been programming him. The Arab is a slave trader. The Arab is a slave trader. That's terrified. The black man is terrified. Arab, when you say Arab, is, yeah, this is the slave trader. The Christian, the white man has already programmed him. Every Arab is a slave trader. You are the guys, they say, who took the Negroes across the Atlantic. That's a lie. It's the Christian, the white man took them across. But they say, the Arab, the Arab, the Arab, slave trader. Now, you come along as an exploiter with the white man. I'm telling you, your capital is in danger. As soon as that guy says, look, you have now taken the place of the white man. 
in company with him, in partnership with him, you want to suck our blood. And I tell you, your capital as well as your life and our lives are all in danger. You are welcome. Ahlul, Sahib, Ahsalam, come man, come. As, don't come as a, serve, as a guest of the white man. Come on your own steam. The country is open for you. Come as a guest of the Muslims. And do, you are free to go about and meet Butelezi, the Zulu chief, meet ANC leader Mandela, meet anybody, everybody, talk to everybody. Don't go along as a stooge or the tail of the white man. You will get suffocated. And when you come along, you want to do business, try and involve the black man in that business of yours. And that black gold needs this gold. He needs a message. The white man did a beautiful job. He gave them a book and took away the land. He gave them the Bible and took away the land all over and made them satisfied. He gave them churches, different, different, separate, separate churches. You can't have your, you can't go and pray with the white man. You can't go and pray with the colored. You African, you have your own church. Different language group, different churches. You can't also pray together. You are an Anglican, you are a Lutheran, you are a Presbyterian, you are a Seventh Adventist, you are a Jehovah's Witness, you are a Roman Catholic. Shh. He divided the African into 3,000 different sects and denominations. He's done a beautiful job of divide and rule. But he used the book, the Bible, in his own language. He's given the Bible to him in his own language. And in every dialect of the land, Bible is available. Now, if we want him to change, we have to give him a book. The white man gave him a church, a separate church, and a book. We also gave him a separate a church and a book. The church means the place of worship. We have more than 400 masjids in the country. We say they're open to all, at all times. Ahlan wa sahlan. Our masjids are open to all, whether black or white, rich or poor, open to all at all times. So the masjids are there. When we need more, we'll build them. But 400 masjids we have in the country at the present moment. What about the book? We have just succeeded in producing the first part of the Holy Quran in Zulu. My little society, we did 100,000 so far. 100,000, we say Urdu, one lakh, eight lakh. Sounds like a million. It's not a million, 100,000. Now we want one million more copies of this book. Two million more copies of this book to give it to the Zulu. And I want our brothers in your, this part of the world, you want to do business? I say you need an insurance policy. Any business, you want an insurance policy. You want to secure your, your capital. You need an insurance policy. I said, this is the insurance policy. With Allah and with mankind. You win the guy's heart. That this is my brother. The Arab is rich, he makes me happy. He's my brother. He's my brother. He's well to do. He's got a Mercedes Benz. Alhamdulillah. He's got his own private planes. Alhamdulillah. Allah has blessed him. He's my brother. Insurance policy. You have to win the hearts and minds of the people. And there is nothing better than Allah's kalam to do the job. We have done the job as a start. First part, we said, give it to him. Two million copies, each costing two dollars each. And I'm looking for, I will look for, I'll meet our brother Obey, Sheikh Obey, when I come back. And if I can, Sheikh Maktoum, when I come back. And Sultan Muhammad Qasimi of Sharjah, when I come back, inshallah, I say, look, I want your help in this. Do business, but in the insurance policy. This is the insurance policy you must take out. The Christian, he's doing the job. Allah, he's doing the job. Unimaginable. You remember I told you a little while back about the Jehovah's Witnesses. A small group of people, not even two million in the world. Among so many other things. They produced 84 million copies of this one book in 95 languages. You're hearing all right. What I said, 84 million. <laughs> it's, it's hard to believe. It's 84 million copies of one book. They call this book the truth that leads to eternal life. 
And that book is not a booklet. This is called a booklet, you know, a little book. That book is 192 pages. How many they produced? 84 million. In what languages? What language you want? Arabic? They got it. Urdu? They got it. Zulu? Come on, come on, man. Swahili? What language you want? In 95 languages. Can we Muslims compete with that? With that one little sect, one little group? Can we? Let's bow our head down in shame and acknowledge that we are nowhere, nowhere in the picture. We are not fit for the work Allah has been appointed us to do. We are not fit. We are nowhere near anything what the Christian is doing. The Bible, the Holy Bible. I'm reading, 800,000 Bibles sent out, art lack. Scriptures in Afrikaans, English and Zulu were most in demand. Mr. Van der Merwe said, 210,933 Afrikaans, 191,500 English, 11,070 Zulu, 814,000 Bibles distributed in bulk, and they're talking about three million scriptures by one Bible society alone. Three million pieces of literature by one Bible society in one year alone. Hmm. We are only asking for one million of these. Maybe it'll last as a year or more. One million of these. Yeah. A Christian gift free to all Muslims. It's not for Hindus. Not for Jews, not for other Christians, but for you, Muslims. A Christian gift free to all Muslims. The Holy Bible, the Word of God. What you have to do, just fill the coupon. It says here, application for a free Bible. You have to say, yes, I'm a Muslim. And I would like to receive a free copy of the Holy Bible. Just put your name and address and you beggars will get it free. All you beggars, you get it free. You just write for it and you get it free. We say, we want to give this to this black gold. The black gold in South Africa is the African. And among the African, the biggest powerful force are the Zulus. Give him this book and make him our brother. The Christians have produced the Bible in 2,000 different languages. <laughs> It's unimaginable. Wallah, 2,000 different languages. They have 11 different Bibles for the Arabs alone. <laughs> for the Arabs, there are 11 different Bibles for the Arabs alone. What do you want to do with different, 11 different Bibles for Arabs? To me, there was one, only one Arabic, the Arabic of the Quran. There's one, only one Arabic language. That is the language of the Quran. That's what I thought. But now the Christians are telling me, no, these Arabs, they, they speak different dialects, different laja. The Syrian, the script is different. Moroccan, different script. Tunisian, different script. Palestinian, different dialect. South Sudanese, different dialect. I didn't know all that. Here are samples from the Christian magazine, the Gospels in many tongues, 11 different Arabic Bibles. This is the trouble they have taken for you. I want to know what are you doing for them? Nothing. Nothing. The South Africans, they are now going to distribute 10 million free Bibles. 10 million. Our de clerk with government money, that's our taxpayers' money, he's going to contribute 1 million. And the British and Foreign Bible Society will give 9 million more. 10 million Bibles they want to distribute. We are only asking for 1 million of these little books here. That is all. The South Africa is a red China to get Bible press. Look, they're thinking ahead, ahead. The clerk has gone to Russia now. Do you know that? He's in Russia. To do what? Not only to do business with the Russians, man, Bibles, Bibles, he's thinking about his Lord, his mission. The white man is thinking wherever he goes, he wants to do business and he wants to propagate his faith. We want to go and do business and we sell our souls. Our souls are sold out. We go for a good time. 
Where? To Bombay? Huh? Beirut? Huh? Bangkok? Where do you go there for? To preach Islam, to propagate Islam. Your forefathers, I'm telling the Arabs, they did a beautiful job. Allah says, do business. Allah wants us to do business. Our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, do business. Even if you have to buy and sell needle and thread. Sweet, sweet haga. Even if you have to buy and sell needle and thread, do business. The Arabs, Alhamdulillah, they went out in the sailing boats. They came to my part of the world in India, Surat district above Bombay. They came to do business and in the process they converted my ancestors. They went to Malaysia to do business. In the process they converted the people. They went to Indonesia, they did the same. They went to China and 50 million Chinese are Muslims. No Muslim army went there. East Africa, up to Mozambique. The Arab did the job. He went to do business and he spread Islam. On the West Coast, he went to do business and he spread Islam. That's your forefathers. I'm telling the Arab, that's your forefathers. You can't go anymore in by sailing ships. Finish. It's not for you. You've gone too soft. Even in, a, in, a, in, a, in an air-conditioned aeroplane, you dare not go to Borneo. You dare not go to the Congo. You dare not go to the Amazon. You are not fit to do that job anymore. You can't do that job. You know that. In an aeroplane, air-conditioned aeroplane, you can't go to the Congo, I'm telling you. To do propagation. Dawa. So Allah sends customers to your door. Look at them. All the Hindus are there. Have you dealt with the message? All the Christians are there. All the Buddhists are here. They're seeking for jobs, but you won't talk. You can't go to that country, and they're coming to you here. As workers, they respect you, they look up to you with respect, and you still you can't open your mouth. I want to know why. When the Pakistani comes here, hmm, I'm not talking about the Muslims. <laughs> Sadiq and Bhatti and Zahiruddin Mirza. Some Pakistani? Is it, it some Pakistani? Yes. Who are they? Zahiruddin Mirza is a bishop of Pakistan. He is here eating your food and propagating Christianity in your country. This Sadiq and Bhatti here in Sharjah, he's got his church, the Pakistan Church of Sharjah. He's propagating Christianity here in your country. What are you doing? I want to know. What are you doing? Allah chose you, the Arab, in the first instance, and his language as the vehicle of his message to mankind, the Holy Quran. He chose you and your language. What are you doing? Allah chose you, the Arab, in the first instance, and his language as the vehicle of his message to mankind, the Holy Quran. He chose you and your language. instance your forefathers did the job Alhamdulillah. from the Atlantic to the Pacific they did the job and they relaxed 800 years in Spain they had a jolly good time our Arab brothers they had a jolly good time not heeding the warning not heeding the warning they're reading the Quran they're doing tilawat the Quran they're reading Arabi and they read the Quran and they understand Allah says, Kam jannati wa How many of the gardens and the fountains they left behind? Wazuin wa makamin kareem and cornfields and monumental buildings. You see them? Around here. And cornfields and monumental buildings. And wealth and the amenities of life in which they took so much delight. Kazalika wa aurasnaha kaumun akhareen. Thus other people were made to inherit these things. And neither the heavens nor the earth shed a tear for them, nor was respite given to them anymore. They read it. They understood what it means. But they were laughing at the Egyptians. Fear on the fool. 
You know, Allah sent him nine plagues. Look at all the riches he had, the granaries of Egypt, the Nile River bringing in all the silt and the things that they planted and they grew and they have this Abu Simbel and what and what not. They have the mighty monuments there in Egypt. Go and see it even today. The pyramids, they can't understand how they got the things together. That between 50 feet, 50 ton rocks, blocks, if you put them together and if there's one inch off on one side and three quarters on the other, how do you get them together? How do you get these things together? The 4,000, 5,000 years ago, how did they get these two rocks together that you can't put a cardboard in between? How? They can't understand. This is what they had. What did they do? They didn't hit the warning. So our brothers in Spain are laughing at the fools in Egypt, Fir'aun and his people. The fools. You see, they didn't hit the warning. Allah destroyed them. <laughs> I'm saying, you fools, we are in the firing line. But no, no, you see the other guy, the other fool. Baghdad, Samad from Bukhara, and Harun al-Rashid, Mamun al-Rashid, a veritable fairy land. You can only create those scenes in films, that's all. In real life, no more. What happened? On the borders of the Mongols, barbarians. You want to preach to them, Islam? <laughs> what can they understand? What will they understand? Your forefathers could. The most barbaric people on earth. You Arabs. In the Ayyam of Jahiliya, you married your stepmothers. Did the Mongols do that? Did the Spanish people do that? <laughs> Wine bibbers. You people excel them all. You are greater drunkards than the Spanish people. They didn't marry the stepdaughters, stepmothers. They didn't bury the daughters alive. You did. The Arabs in the Ayyam of Jahiliya. That given the master historian describes them, he said the human brute, animal in human form. The human brute, almost without sense, is poorly distinguished from the rest of the animal creation. The only thing that distinguishes him from the animal is the form. The form. Fi ahsan taqweem. Allah created him the best of moles. Otherwise, animal and worse than animal. That's you. And Allah extricated you. He made you the torchbearers of light and learning to the world. It can't do that to the Spanish people? <laughs> no. It can't do to the Mongols? No. Allah says, Fatarab Basu. You wait. You hadith, you wait. For what? Hatta yati Allah bi amri until Allah's decision comes about for your destruction. And you waited. 800 years. Allah waited and you waited. 800 years. Allah waited for us in India. 1,000 years we ruled India. 1,000 years. And 1,000 years we didn't do the job. Allah says, you wait. And we waited. Today, <laughs> we can't even cry in that country. Do you know that? You can't even cry. Why are you hitting us? You can't cry. Why? You didn't do the job. Allah says, فَتَرَبَّسُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَحْدِ الْقَوْمِ الْفَاسِقِينَ You are a fasik people. With all your black patches on your forehead, and your salat and zakat and all, you are a fasik people if you don't do the job. Brothers, here a start. Make a start. Make a start. One million, two million Zulu Qurans. Each and every one of you, you can contribute for one Quran. Five Qurans. Fifty Qurans. This million I'm talking about, inshallah, I'll meet somebody with. He says, okay, inshallah. I might, I'm, I'm very, very optimistic. You see, in all my life, I'm very optimistic. But let's get started. The papers are given to you with the address. He said, look here is somehow you can, if you want to, get together. If you can't do yourself $50, $100, $1,000. If you can't, get a few friends together. I said, come on, man, you give five, you give two, you give one. We'll put together and we'll send it for Quran, Holy Quran account. The people of Africa, they are the readiest people for Islam. In their concept, the, the Zulu, let's start with the Zulu, that's where I come from, the Zulu land. The Zulu, you ask the Zulu that you worship God, he said yes. Before the white man came, you know about God, he said yes. What is his name in your language? What do you call him? So it's Umvelinga. Umvelinga. Sounds like Wallahu Ghani. Umvelinga. What is he like? Was he like a man or a monkey, elephant or a snake? He says, no, Nimza, sir. He is a pure and holy spirit. He does not beget and is not begotten. And there is nothing like unto him. 
he is actually giving you a translation of Surah Ikhlas. You ask him, have you read the Quran? I said, what is that? What are you talking about? What Quran is it? What is that? No, no, he doesn't know. He never heard the new Quran in his life. He doesn't know the Quran. You want to give him now. But he's quoting you the Quran in his own language. He knew about ethics and morality. He knew that adultery was bad, stealing was bad, lying was bad. All these ten commandments he knew before the white man came. He didn't have a name to his religion because his language was not a written language. The white man did a beautiful job. He gave him a book in his own language and gave him his script, the Latin script. He did the job. I just come from Sudan. I got the visa in Sudan. You remember for Nigeria? Now before going to Nigeria, I'm sorry, to Sudan, I have a habit, call it an obsession. If I'm to go to any country, I like to master the language of that nation before going. In 1977, I was supposed to go to Indonesia, so I learned Indonesian. I was supposed to go to Nigeria, I learned Hausa, Hausa Fulani, the language of the Nigerian. You get started, man. I wanted to go to the Lebanon. I learned the Arabic of the Bible. I wanted to go to Israel. I'm afraid that people won't allow me, but I want to go to Israel, talk to the Jews. I learned Hebrew. I learned the Hebrew, language of the Jew. I want to go to Spain. I learned Spanish. In my own country, I learned speak, I speak Zulu. I speak Afrikaans and English I'm speaking now. <laughs> what language you want to hear? What language you want to hear? I want to go to Kenya. I learned Swahili. I <laughs> said, so what language you want to hear? Look, this is my hobby. I love to do that. Just acquire some little knowledge about the man's language. So before going to the Sudan, um, I said, I knew some Arabic of the Bible. Quranic Arabic, I know a little bit more. But the Bible, of the, the Quran is the Arabic of the Bible. I said, now the Dinka, we are at war with the Dinkas. General John Garang is a Dinka. He is like a Zulu. But the Zulu is in South Africa, the Dinkas are in Southern Sudan. And this guy, we are at war with him. That's right. We are at war. I said, sooner or later, inshallah, I hope and I pray, and the Muslims are praying that the Muslims gain victory. But I have been telling them when I went there, and I tell you all, that you can win the war and lose the peace. You can win the war, but you lose the peace. You don't know how to consolidate that for all. You'll ever be at war. You defeat him in the field, but it's a continuous battle, and the whole of Africa is behind the black man. And the southern Sudanese are treated as a black man. They are the black man. You Sudanese, you say you are an Arab. Is it a fact? Yes. He said, we are Arabs. So I said, look, man, you look like an African. No insult, please, please. Don't take offense. I said, look, to me, you look like an African. So yes, but I'm an Arab. I said, okay, okay. But you look like an African to me. And to the whole of Africa, you look like an African. What makes you Arab? He says, you see, our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that whoever speaks Arabic is, a, is, a, is an Arab. So that definition, you are Arab. Anybody who speaks Arabic, if all of Pakistan was speaking Arabic, you would be also saying we are Arabs. That's qualification, that definition of a Nabi gave. Whoever speaks Arabic is an Arab. From that point, you Sudanese are Arabs. But from your looks, ethnically, you look same like the Dinkas to me. Please forgive me. No insult. But now how are you going to talk to the Dinkas? So I've got the Dinka Bible. They tell me there are four different dialects of Dinkas alone. They, they got four, they got the Bible in the four Dinka dialects of the, for this people, four different dialects in their language. So I got one of them. I said, the one that John Garam, his dialect, I want. So somehow I got that. And I learned. And I went into Sudan. I go to the, put up in Hilton Hotel. I go to the receptionist. And I said, you know, I was trying to learn your language. That's how I opened up. Anyway, I said, you know, I was trying to learn your language. He said, yes. I said, listen, he's thinking Arabic, I'm going to talk. I said, apiata batin, viyaki lik eith, apiati nunu kwek, tijal an, nasha jil, kedu jil, Shibu inunukwik kunalar ikabatuj inunukwik. That's good. That's not our language. I said Sudanese. I said no, no. That's the language of the Dinka. 
I said, oh, he's not Sudanese. Yes, yes, he's Sudanese. That is the Dinka language. That guy there, the porter, he's a Dinka. So I go to the porter. You see? He looks the same African like the other. I said, yes. I said, you know, I was trying to learn your language. He said, yes. I said, listen, if I'm making a mistake, if I'm murdering your language, please forgive me. He says, that's what I told him. He said, listen, apiata basin, we are is, apiata nunu quick, tijal and nasha jin. He's done, he's done, he's done. You know, me, I'm supposed to be an enemy. He was, are you Dinka? That means I'm at war. I want to fight you. You Dinka, you're fighting my people. Hmm? I'm a Muslim, you can see that. You want to fight? I don't want to fight. I said, I'm trying to learn your language. And we all love our language. That's sweet. Wallah, this is the sweetest thing is our own mother tongue. Whatever language it is, how silly it sounds. Your language, my language to me, is the sweetest language on earth, my own, Gujarati. <laughs> to you, maybe Urdu, Arabic, but my language, I love it. So, I, I repeat this to the Dinka, the porter. He corrected me, some pronunciation. So I'm asking him, you people before the white man came, who Christianized them. This guy's a Christian. He's a Roman Catholic. I said, before the white man came, did you have a concept of God? Did you people believe in God? He said, yes. I said, what do you call him? What is the name of God? He said, Nihalik. Nihalik. The Dinka first. Nihalik. His name is Nihalik. I said, have you got a statue of him? An image, an idol? He said, no. I said, why not? Couldn't you carve out of wood the shape of a man or a monkey or an elephant or a snake? He said, yes. Or out of clay, could you not have formed a statue? He said, yes. And I said, why didn't you do it? Why didn't your people make a statue of your God? He said, sir, how can you make a statue of light? He is light. And you call him a kafir. You call him a kafir. You call him an enemist. That's what the white man told you to call him. Is he a kafir? He is telling you, Allah knows samawati wal ard. Allah is the light of the heavens. The, the Azulu is telling you, Kulhu Allahu Akhar. Allahu Samad. Lam yadid wa lam yulad wa lam yakun lahu. Without using the name Allah. He is telling you, this is our concept. And you say, he's a kafir. 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 Astaghfirullah. This is the sickness we have inherited from the white man. I says, get rid of the sickness. Talk to the guy. And nobody, nobody, I'm telling you, in the Sudan knows the language of the South. Nobody! I have a crowd like this. I said, how many of you know the name of God Almighty in the Dinka language? Put up your hands. So two guys put up their hands in a crowd of this size. So I said, you are a Dinka. He said, yes. That means he's a convert from Dinka to Islam, so he knows the land. The other guy, I didn't ask him. But in a crowd of this size, only two guys knew the name of God Almighty in the language. And you want to win him over. How? You can't even talk his language. This is sickness with our people. You come along from India, Pakistan, Molvi Sahib, and you stay with us for 50 years, and in 50 years, you don't even learn to say Salaam Alaikum to the other man in his language. To the Zulu, you can't say Sagaboana or Sanboana, more than one. That in 50 years, the guy doesn't learn. The white man comes along, and in three months, he learns your language, and he challenges you in your language. He preaches to you in your language. He wants to do a job. You don't want to do a job. April 13, Time Magazine, get it. You read there, in America, there is a section in America where more languages are spoken than anywhere else in the country. America is supposed to be a uni-language country. English, 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 English. But there is an area, multiple of languages are spoken. In America, they tell you where, where. They tell you it is Utah or Utah. Salt Lake City. There is another Christian sect called the Mormons. Mormons. These Mormons in the Utah University of 28, this Mormon University, there are 28,000 students. In among those 28,000 students, they are learning 38 different languages. You teach that in Islamabad? How many? In Umul Qura? How many? Is there Al Ain? How many? Come on, come on. Madina University, how many? 
In that university, they're teaching 38 different languages. So it makes you wonder why. What are they going to do with the 38 different languages? No, they have a mission. Every Mormon gives two years of his life for missionary work. Free. That's his zakat. That is his zakat. Two years of his life he gives for missionary work. So now, while they're studying, they said, right, where are you going to go? So one guy say, I want to go to South Africa. Mm -hmm. What languages do they speak? So they speak Zulu, Kosa, Chwana. Mm. What else? Well, they also speak English, Afrikaans. That's right, I'll pick Afrikaans. I'll talk to the white man. So he's learning Afrikaans. One of the youngest of the world's languages, and a small group of four million men, women, and children, their language the guy's learning. Second language. No, I'm sorry, the first one, first one in the list you read. Amazing. It says American Sign Language. You see sometimes in the plane, you know, the person is talking and somebody behind is doing like this. He's telling you what, what the person is talking is for the deaf and the dumb. Sign language. Say American Sign Language number one. Second one, Afrikaans number two, three. 38 different languages are listed. Why? They want to do a job. You, you don't want to do any job. You are satisfied. You Urdu follow Urdu and English because we need English to make a living. And Urdu is your mother tongue. Okay. You Arab? <laughs> Arab you are satisfied. You want to learn another language? Yeah, maybe say English. They are learning 38 because they want to do a job. You don't want to do any job. There's some, it can, look, man, think, man, think. Why is this guy doing that? Why is he doing that? Can we learn from him? Can we emulate his example? Uh, we don't have you to invent the wheel once more again. Go and look at the enemy, what he's doing, learn from him, and get on from there. So, I don't know, my dear brothers and sisters, I would rather leave myself open to you for questions and answers. There might be so many things that you want to know about Africa in the field of Dawa, or about the field of Dawa in other places here, in what's happening in the UAE, what's happening in Saudi Arabia, what's happening in Bahrain and Kuwait. What do you want to know where this confrontation is taking place in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia? I am in the field, and if I don't know, I'll make it my duty to find out for next time. I'm at your disposal entirely. Wa akhru dawan an alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Mr. Chairman, with your kind permission, I want to put a question. Please. Recently, I heard a speaker from Tanzania, fortunately, he is present here, saying that in Tanzania he is not allowed, he is not free to preach Islam. As soon as he reaches there, he is put behind the bars. In your opinion, is it something good for the Muslim nations to stop preaching of Christianity or other religions? Would you recommend that in Islamic countries at least, where people have the authority to put a ban on preaching other than Islam? They can come and work and take their bread if they want, but no preaching is allowed. Would you recommend that? idea about Pakistan. The Christians are boasting that they have perverted more Pakistanis into Christianity since independence than the previous hundred years of British rule. They are boasting that there are so many cities in Pakistan with more than one lakh Christians each. Karachi, more than one lakh Christians. Lakh means 100,000. More than one lakh Christians. Multan, more than one lakh Christians. Lahore, more than one lakh Christians. Sial Court, with the border with the enemy, more than two lakh Christians. And they are saying that there are so many towns and villages in the Punjab, there are more Christians than Muslims. I went and spoke to Junejo. I don't know what he was then, a few years back. To Junejo in Pakistan. I was giving him these facts and figures in his office. So he called his aides and he's telling them, Pakistan to Islam ka kila hai. Usko, this is getting cracked. The Pakistan is a fortress of Islam and it is getting cracked. And you people are not informing me what's going on. I 
spoke to Ziaul Haq, same response, poor fellow doesn't know what's going on in the country, he didn't know. Now, I personally, I said, now this missionary is coming from the outside, what's happening in Nigeria. They get this missionary, the hot gospel preachers, to come and provoke the Muslims, and the Muslims, because they, have, they don't know what, how to answer, they get frustrated and they take action into their own hands. Riots taking place. Pakistan is more peaceful, as far as that is concerned. Now, to me, I said, every Muslim, he must become a propagator. We must welcome the people to come into your country and give battle to them. But you are not armed, you don't know what to talk. You don't know how to talk. I said, look, learn from me. Look, I'm not a professor, but there's something I can give you. I can give you a survival kit. You know, this is an atom war. You need some survival kit where you can get into some shelter somewhere and you might exist there for a month, two months, you can exist, you can be alive. Survival kit. And I discovered this kit in Sudan. Amazing. You know, wherever I go, I learn something. Something comes my way. In the Sudan. You see, about 10 years ago, I was stranded in Khartoum. I was going from Doha, Qatar to back home. So I'm asking the people, what is the shortest, shortest line to South Africa? So they tell me from uh, Doha to uh, Khartoum, Khartoum to Nairobi, Nairobi to Johannesburg and Durban. I said, right. Are they connecting flights? They said, yes. So I took the flight from Doha, Qatar. Land in Khartoum, no connecting flight. And the Sudanese gave me such wonderful welcome <laughs> that I cried to Allah, Ya Barit Allah, for this I want Jannah. I don't say for Salah, Zakat, Hajj, Song, but for that, what I went through, the things where they put me in that airport building, what they did to me, I'm crying to Allah, I said, for this I want Jannah. Not for anything else, for this. I know that's matter between me and Allah. You can ask me, have you a right to talk like that? I said, don't worry about it. That's between me and Allah. I spoke to him like that. I want Jannah for this. And somehow I managed to get out. Two o'clock in the morning. I go to a hotel. The next morning I just turn around and say, let's have a look. I find a university Muslim bookshop. I go there. I want to know whether you get a Quran. He says, no. I send a translation. He says, no. An Arabic Quran. He says, no. University Islamic bookshop. No. What have you got? On Islam, nothing. I fall around. I find Mao's thoughts. Thoughts of Mao. Mao's thoughts. I find the Gospel of St. Mark in the Islamic bookshop. Next door is the Bible Society bookshop. I go there and say, what Bibles have you got? I say, what Bibles do you want? I said, no, what have you got? What do you want? I said, you got English Bible? I said, yes. You got Arabic Bible? I said, yes. I said, you got Southern Sudanese language? He said, yes. So what do you want? I said, no, 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 I'm only asking. That was 10 years ago. Now I go again, I'm welcome, alhamdulillah. Now, I make a beeline for the same university bookshop. Have you got the Quran? No. Translation? No. Arabic Quran? No. What have you got? Ah, I found a book, Islam in Africa. That's the subject of this evening's talk. I got that title from there. I'm interested about Islam in Africa. I stand and read abuses on our Nabi Karim written by Christian missionaries, puts Rushdi to shame, or maybe Rushdi got his inspired inspiration from there. And they're attacking the Sudanese in the book. These are barbarians, uncivilized, uncouth people, you know, savages in the book, and they're selling that. I paid 850 pounds for that book. Don't get frightened, just like 850 cents, American cents. Eight dollars, 50 cents. I paid 850 pounds for that book. Next door, Bible Society. I go there, I say, yes. What Bibles you got? I say, what do you want? I say, English Bible? I say, yes. Say, How much? 15 pounds. That's 15 pence. That's 15 cents. Actually, 25 American cents. I say, right. My son says, we buy two case blocks. How much? He said, no, no reduction in price. So, for 25 American cents each, we bought two cases of the Bible. Two cases, 48 altogether. Now, I've got the university students. 
I have given some other course for them. Now, everybody gets a Bible each. Everybody a Bible each. This is your scat missile. And I'll show you how to prime it. How to use this. This scat, the enemy is throwing at you, is making you to swallow it. Now I said, how you turn it back on him? Got the Bibles? Everybody. Right? I said, now open up. What is this book? This is the Holy Bible. What do you call it in Arabic? Huh? Yes. What is it? Injil. That's Injil. So they said also, Injil. That's right. This is the Injil. I said, open the Injil now. First book of the Injil. Called Genesis. Open chapter 19. Got it, everybody? Got 19? Yes. Verse 30. Look for verse 30. Got it? Say yes. I'm a teacher now. I'm teaching class. Right, read. So it starts reading. Next one. How to fool was you? You. Carry on. And your ears go red. What you're reading. Lut Hazrat Lut His daughters are seducing him, having sex with him night after night by getting him drunk. That's that. Right? Mark it. Mark it in your book. Prime it. Prime it for use. Same book. Don't go far. Genesis chapter 35. Verse 22. Open. Reuben. One, uh, one of the sons of Yaakov He goes and has sex intercourse with his mother. 